council members. I see Kelly, Joe, Mayor, and I see Tony. So whenever you're ready, let me know and we'll get started. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Do we need a second? Okay, um, Kieran, are you all set to go? All good on our end. Is that a yes? I think he said all good on our end, so. Okay, uh, good on my end, we're, we're started. Okay, so I'm calling this meeting to order. It is the regular meeting of the Encinitas City Council, 6 p.m. on Wednesday, November 18, 2020. Um, may we please have a roll call? Yes, Mayor. Councilmember Hubbard is absent. Councilmember Mosca? No, there she is. I'm here. Is here? Oh, okay, great. Sorry, I did not see you, Councilmember Hubbard. Okay, Councilmember Hubbard is here. Councilmember Mosca? Here. Councilmember Cran? Here. Deputy Mayor Hinsey? Here. And Mayor Blakespear? Here. Record will show that all members of the City Council are present. Okay, thank you. And I invite you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I think we'll put up a flag here. Okay, thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, so now we have special presentations and proclamations. The first one is a certificate of appreciation to Dr. Beatrice Villarreal, and I see her here, which is very nice to see you. Um, I will uh, <clears throat> read the proclamation, and then I'll give you a few sec, a few, uh, a little bit of time to say a few words. Thank so, you. hold on, let me pull that up. Okay, so this is a certificate of recognition presented to Dr. Beatrice Villarreal on behalf of the Encinitas Mayor and City Council. With sincere appreciation for your important contributions with assisting Latino families for 30 years, we are grateful for your efforts in teaching families through your Mano a Mano Foundation and emceeing our Dia de los Muertos events for the past six years. Congratulations on the launch of your new logo and webpage. We wish you continued success in the future. <laughs> so now I'll, I'll ask you if you'd like to say a few words. I just wanna say, uh, I feel very honored and uh, very blessed to receive this recognition and more especially because it comes from you, from uh, Catherine Blixper, that you are the mayor of Encinitas. Encinitas has been my home for more than 30 years. Um, and it really has been uh, my goal to help uh, the community and to many, the Latino community. Uh, and I've been serving there, for, as you say, more than 30 years. I've been uh, also planning the Drug and Alcohol Prevention and Education Conference in Encinitas, thanks to the city of Encinitas for more than 27 years. It's the only uh, conference like, like, like this type in Spanish in the whole county of San Diego. And it's very popular, you know, uh, people from all over the county comes and I hope to continue doing this. Um, and also thank you, I wanna say a special thank you to Naime Woodward, Jim Gillian, Gabby Beas, and all the volunteers who made possible the Dia de los Muertos and the Day of the Dead in Encinitas. Uh, and a big thanks to the community that is watching right now because I'm, I invited the whole community from the whole county that is watching right now I, because I feel very honored. I, I just wanna say thank you for, for, um, for watching me and for all your support. And also a special thank you to my family, my husband, Jorge, my daughter, Beatrice, and my son, Jorge, uh, Eugenio, uh, Beatrice's um, husband, and my grandkids. And especially my family who is also watching from Mexico City and Costa Rica, San Jose, Costa Rica. And I wanna dedicate this recognition to my grandfather, Pedro Garcia, who just passed away today. I just, I know he's watching from, from above uh, and I wanna dedicate this recognition to him. Uh, he was very special to us. And uh, anyhow, I wanna say thank you to all the community and I hope to continue doing this type of job with my Mano a Mano Foundation. 
Well, thank you so much. And I'm so sorry to hear about the loss in your family just today. That's, yes, that's, I know. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and the last time I saw you, you were uh, all decorated <laughs> in a beautiful La Dia Catrina. de los Muertos <laughs> paint and costume, and you look yes. fabulous, just Thank a beautiful you. costume. It's and I, that I love to do, you can tell. <laughs> I know, you do, you have such heart in it. And I want to encourage you to apply for our commissions, because we okay. do have our commission appointments uh, coming up soon. Okay. Um, and we would, uh, I think the Parks and Recreation Commission, which does all this wonderful programming in the city of Encinitas, would be a great match. So I encourage okay. you to I put would it love in your to name. help in any way my city. I'm very proud to be, a, a, you know, to, to live here in Encinitas. And I'm going to die in Encinitas because I'm not moving anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I great. love, yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much, everybody. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Yes, well, thank, thank you for you. joining us. And thank you for, to everybody who tuned in for this. I saw the press release that you sent out about it. That's great. Yes, yes thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> okay, you. great. Um, and you're welcome to stay for as much of the okay. meeting as you want. Um, thank or, you so or much. slip out, of course. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, so the next thing we have is um, a proclamation in honor of our uh, small businesses. Um, so I'm just going to uh, read this proclamation here. And there are a number of whereases, which uh, you're probably aware of. Uh, so whereas, we start with a very big picture. Uh, the government of the city of Encinitas celebrates our local small businesses and the contributions that they make to our local economy and community. According to the United States Small Business Administration, there are 31.7 million small businesses in the United States, and they represent 99.9% .9 of all firms with paid employees in the United States. They are responsible for 65.1% of net new jobs created from 2000 to 2019. Whereas small businesses employ 47.1% of the employees in the private sector which is really amazing. That's almost half of employees in the private sector. 62% of US small businesses reported that they need to see consumer spending return to pre-COVID levels by the end of 2020 in order to stay in business. 65% of US small business owners said it would be most helpful to their businesses to have their regulars return and start making purchases again. And three quarters of US consumers are currently looking for ways to shop small and support their community. Whereas 96% of consumers who shopped on Small Business Saturday agree that shopping at small independently owned businesses supports their commitment to making purchases that have a positive social, economic, and environmental impact. And 97% of consumers who shopped on Small Business Saturday agree that small businesses are essential to their community. And whereas 95% of consumers who shopped on Small Business Saturday reported that the day makes them want to shop or eat at small independently owned businesses all year long, not just during the holiday season. Whereas Encinitas supports our local businesses that create jobs, boost our local economy and preserve our community. And whereas advocacy groups, as well as public and private organizations across the country have endorsed the Saturday after Thanksgiving as Small Business Saturday. So that's not this Saturday, but next Saturday. Therefore, I, Catherine Blakespear, Mayor of the City of Encinitas, do hereby proclaim November 28, 2020 as Small Business Saturday and urge the residents of our community and communities across the country to support small businesses and merchants on Small Business Saturday and throughout the year. I don't know if we have anybody who wants to speak on this from any of our Main Street organizations, but the, uh, we have great Main Street organizations. We have businesses we need to support. And I hope everybody makes an effort to shop at our local businesses, not just on Amazon, um, for your holiday shopping this year. Um, I would like to comment that, uh, you know, the proclamation says it all about the importance of the small businesses. But when you look at, um, especially the 101 corridor, um, that is indeed uh, a, a key part of our economic uh, vitality. Um, yes, out in the El Camino Real corridor, we get much more tax revenue from the big box stores and many of the uh, larger stores there, but there too, there are a number of small businesses that are really critical to um, the, the wonderful community that we have here in Encinitas. And, I have been extremely impressed by the last six months and the efforts of business owners and their resilience to 
the uh, uh, pandemic health orders that have come out of the county, they, they uh, definitely have made it challenging, um, but especially our restaurants who have figured out ways to uh, get their customers served outdoors. And that has taken a partnership with the city because we are uh, allocating parking spaces for some of those tables that patrons are sitting at. And uh, I actually do look forward to the conversation post pandemic about what we may or may not do with regard to um, the reduced parking that we're currently living with. Okay, thank you. Um, Council member Henze. I'll chime in if we don't have any representatives from the Main Street, and I will speak as a former Main Street professional that um, this event was brought to Encinitas first by Karis Rhodes when she was my uh, boss over at Lucadia Main Street. And I think it was Cindy Darlington, who's an Encinitas resident, who recommended this event to us. And I'm so pleased that now the other Main Streets have embraced it and that it's become this really cohesive event across all, core, all portions of our, of our Main Street community. And it's really so much fun and I encourage everybody to go by bike. And I know I also work at a small business and I know that this time of year is so important for our annual revenue to be able to stay in business for the rest of the year. And so I too encourage everybody when you have the option to shop local, spend your dollars locally. And um, you know, if you're not comfortable uh, being in downtown during that Saturday, then I'm, there are so many businesses that are willing to accommodate you. So you just give them a call and they'll probably do curbside pickup for you or even delivery. Thank you for all that information. Council Member Mosca. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to also just echo the comments of all my colleagues and say how important it is to support our, our small businesses. As a, as, a, as a person who grew up in a, a family owned small business, I, I personally know how important it is um, to our, the families of Encinitas. Um, and, I, and I know that you know in my area, um, east of the uh, five freeway and around ECR, sometimes you know, it, it appears that there's a lot of big box stores, but there are a lot of family owned businesses, cafes. In fact, there was just a, another cafe that just opened up uh, recently uh, and a lot of other small businesses throughout the ECR uh, corridor um, and throughout um, Liebenheim and New Encinitas. Uh, and they really need our support right now. They are struggling uh, just like all the small businesses and businesses throughout our city and they are struggling. And so they need our support. And so anything we can do from the main streets, helping the main streets to get out the word about uh, Small Business Saturday. Uh, also, you know, the city manager's office, um, you know, uh, we are, um, I've been telling every small business that I, I talk to, um, we really truly want to have your back and help you out. Uh, and so if there are things that, that you think we can do uh, or do better, please get a hold of us. We have a team within the city manager's office who is focused on this and it's a priority for them. Uh, to get relief and help to our small businesses any way that we can. Uh, and so we've been supporting them and, and I want to continue to support them. And I, like I said, it's personal for me, uh, but also, you know, they mean so much to our, our, our city and a lot of the families that run these small businesses live in our city as well. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, so let's move on to the next item, which is oral communication. Yes, and we do have approximately nine um, oral communications is for comments on items that are not listed on the agenda. Um, so when I call you, there's a couple of you that are registered to speak under oral communications and item 10A. So I just want to make sure uh, we're not duplicating. The first speaker is Roe Kruvi. You can start when you are ready. Just need to unmute yourself there. You Need to unmute Roey. There you go. Hello, and thank you <clears throat> for the opportunity. My name is Roey. Um, I've been living in Lucadia for about seven years now, and my parents are just across the uh, Encinitas um, border in Carlsbad, and I've been there for 15 years. Um, I moved here for a job, like I said, about seven years ago, and I've been living in different um, rental spots in Lucadia um, until uh, May when I, uh, my landlord uh, decided not to renew our lease. Um, and since it wasn't technically an eviction, I didn't qualify for the you know, city's uh, protections. 
since then, um, my partner and I have been cobbling together short-term rentals and, and Airbnbs in the area because it's just been really difficult to find um, a suitable place for us to live that's, that's affordable. And um, I, I just wanted to share and bring to the council's attention that I, you know, I, I, I have a job, I, I work here in the city, and I find it really difficult to see a place for myself um, in Encinitas in the future without being some kind of millionaire homeowner. And I'm looking to all of you to share a plan and a vision for how folks like me can, can see a, a place for themselves here in the future um, and establish our roots deeper. Um, and, and, uh, that's all, you know, it's just, it's been, it's been, it's been sad and difficult for us to realize that probably what we have to do is leave this city that we love and have built a community around and, um, have invested, you know, our time and our energy and our resources in. And, uh, so thanks for your time and your attention and congratulations to those of you one re-election. It was a pleasure and an honor to support your campaigns if I could. And um, yeah, I I would love, I read all your emails and check out all the agendas and would love to um, be a part of some uh, creative solution. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bertha Rodriguez. Bertha, are you speaking during oral communications or were you only speaking on item 10A, which is the climate action plan? Only on 10A. Okay, great. Um, Angie Nelson, same question. Are you speaking under oral communications or only on the climate action plan? Uh, 10A. Okay, thank you. I'll call you during that item. Carl Eldinger, same question. Are you speaking under oral communications or only item 10A, which is climate action? Carl, you need yes, to unmute. Yes, I'm speaking. There you go. I'm speaking on both, please. Okay, then you um, can start when ready, and you have three minutes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carl Aldinger, and I'm an organizer for the Sierra Club. My focus is addressing climate crisis. I would like to remind Council that Encinitas's Environmental Commissioner Jim Wong and others have crafted a climate emergency declaration for the city of Encinitas but it has yet to be agendized for discussion and a vote. I feel very strongly that declarations of climate emergency can help our communities and our society understand the immediacy needed for action. They are not in opposition to our climate action plans, but a climate emergency declaration can reframe how immediate our solutions must be. I would like to ask the council to agendize discussion of the climate emergency declaration for the next meeting and continue the work that outgoing Commissioner Wong and others have begun. Encinitas is doing fantastic work on climate and much more of that climate work will be needed. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Scott Hinkle. Scott, you have three minutes. Great, uh, hello everybody, good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Hinkle. Um, I've spoken at the city council uh, a couple of times um, all pretty much on the same topic. So I reside at uh, 1155 Sedonia Street uh, in Encinitas. <clears throat> We've been here for about 14, 15 years. So my fence line, I share a fence line with Ram and Hector. And um, obviously there's been a lot of talk about the development, which is not the topic of today's conversation. Uh, but uh, we wanted to, or I wanted to share with you our recent experience as it relates to the hemp that's being grown on that property. So, um, and I've talked to Bob about this just recently. In fact, yesterday, um, I, I don't think I'm the only one who's shared the same concern, but for the last two months or so, uh, there's been a very strong odor that has emanated from the farm, particularly uh, in the early evening and throughout the night when the wind is calm and we get a slight offshore flow uh, to the extent that um, my family and I close the windows at night because uh, it does cause headaches, uh, at least for my kids. And so uh, it has definitely interfered with the use and enjoyment of our property. 
And so um, it's only been about two months. And so when I talked to Bob about it, Bob's a nice guy. I've talked to him on many topics, uh, but uh, apparently he received, um, and don't quote me, but my understanding is a county license to grow. Um, and so I'm wondering if there are any city ordinances in place today relative to smell and remediation of smell. Um, he assured me that uh, this particular flower that he's grown this season is different than last season's flower, which we had no odor that was interfering with our property. And he said that in uh, February or March of this coming year, the harvest should take place and he does not intend to replant the same flower going forward, um, which is fine. Uh, we just wanted the city to be aware of the issue because it is substantial. I'm not the only one in my neighborhood that feels this way. Um, there's been a long history in terms of the development, the application for growing um, THC marijuana that we've been vocal about as a community. Uh, but we just wanted a record to exist relative to our uh, concern about the odor. And so um, uh, we just want you all to acknowledge there's an issue. Hopefully the issue goes away on its own, but if it doesn't, we want to be able to reference this conversation in particular in the future. So uh, that's all I have to say. Appreciate your consideration um, and hope you all have a good evening. Madam Thank City you. Mayor, Madam City Mayor, is there any, I know that several of us have asked the city attorney and city manager to uh, to further investigate. And I'm wondering uh, just in relation to Scott's um, comments here, whether we can update them, um, whether we've established facts and. Uh, and any kind of solutions um, going forward. Yes, um, I'll ask the city attorney to respond to that. Thank you, yes. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Mosca and others, as well as the city manager, Ms. Antel, has uh, asked our office to advise on this. And we're looking at the current state law and the regulations at the state level relative to um, air quality, et cetera. We do expect that memo. Uh, we thought we would have it today. I'm getting an ETA on that and could certainly provide information to the council as well as any information we have to the public on that area, but it should be expected any time now. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next speaker is Cindy Cremona. Cindy, you can start when ready. You have three minutes. Thank you. Mayor Blake Spear, Council, good evening. Um, yesterday, November 17th, there was yet another large police action in Encinitas, this time on Saxony Road in front of the Leech Tag property entrance. This included multiple sheriff's vehicles, as well as other agencies and possibly undercover officers. I've included photos to support my comments. You would have received them earlier. Once again, the police helicopter flew over neighborhoods looking for a suspect. On October 29th, there was another huge police presence on Orpheus in Encinitas. Inquiring residents were told it was a drug bust with an armed suspect fleeing through neighborhoods. Once again, a helicopter circled neighborhoods, blaring warnings about a suspect on the loose. The Sheriff's Department just this evening is reporting a prostitution ring bust in Encinitas, uh, also yesterday. Mayor, you claim Encinitas is one of the safest cities if not the safest in North County. This, despite the overall increase in crime reported by the FBI in the most recent Sandag report that you didn't seem to know about during a recent election forum. Please tell me if we're so safe, why are neighborhoods experiencing these types of large police actions? Why the increase in sirens and helicopters searching neighborhoods for suspects? This has become an almost daily occurrence. Most importantly, why aren't the residents being told the truth about the reasons for the increase in crime and sadly, that much of it is drug related. What are daily and weekly police actions and helicopter forays costing the city and taxpayers? The election is over, Mayor Blake Spear. No reason to hide the truth any longer. The residents would like to know the truth about our escalating drug problems and why crime continues to invade our once quiet residential neighborhoods. Thank you. Okay, next speaker is Garrett Pribilo. Garrett, are you there? Garrett? Okay, I don't see Garrett. Our next speaker is Susan Pignatori. Susan. 
Susan Pignatero. Yep, you can start when ready. You have three minutes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Susan Pignatero. I'm a newer resident of Lucadia. I just want to thank all of you for your continued service to our community. And as I've not listened to all meetings, but enough to know that it is a very difficult job. Tonight, I'm here to speak as a concerned citizen and resident. I'm here to request an emergency ordinance immediately stopping all hemp growth and cultivation in the city within five miles of residential and special communities, such as schools, senior facilities, and daycare, similar to other, what other cities and counties in California have already done to protect their citizens. I reached out to Bob Eckert and met with he and Josh Schneider after five seniors living in my neighborhood asked what they could do and if I could help. Bob said he would try a few things. However, the problem continues to get worse. This past Saturday, the smell was pervasive for most of the day. On Sunday at approximately 2 a.m., many of us awoke to coughing, lung issues, and other illnesses. Now one neighbor left to a family home in another city, and another is considering options to leave to go to her family home. Over the past, another family home. Over the past weeks, letters have been sent and various calls made to the city and others describing the nuisance created by the cultivation of hemp specifically at 1150 Quail Gardens Drive, the Dram and Eckert Flower Farm. You may hear that the license and plantings have been in place for a while. Well, for months, naive neighbors thought there was a skunk problem, keeping us inside even further than the normal COVID-19 respiratory illness quarantine, waking us up during the night and surprising us with a pungent sticky odor that permeates the house when we walk in and hits us in the face as one opens the door in the morning. This all permeates the fur of our cats and dogs and any clothing left outside. My neighbors and I have had bouts of being sick, coughing, and many are afraid to go to the doctor's office and or the hospital per COVID-19 and knowing that they will be alone or possibly catch COVID-19. The noxious and offensive hemp odors and odors with a tone of pesticide are causing allergic reactions. The feeling of a loss of lung capacity, as one neighbor put it and put it to you in writing, headaches, hoarseness, and nausea in residents, similar to the hoarseness that I have tonight. This has been, a disrupting a health, this has been disrupting a healthy quality of life, home and area exercise and enjoyment of properties and the neighborhood. It includes a local golf course, of which I'm told people are leaving prior to completing their rounds and choosing to play elsewhere upon starting to see this on the golf blogs. Hemp cultivation is fouling our fresh air. The stretch, the stench is strong and pervasive. I please, please urge the city to take immediate action to remove the hemp within a five mile radius of residential schools and daycare. I haven't had time to talk to realtors here. However, as a prior broker, I believe that Mayor Kevin better. I'm sorry, this is my first time making. Oh, no, that's okay. Thought. Okay. Um, I ju it's just a few more just, sentences, if I may. Mayor, is that okay with you? Uh, yeah, a sentence or two more is fine. Okay. Um, I was just going to refer to um, other cities and counties, like the city of Cam Cam Camarillo um, and the mayor, Kevin Kildee's letter, which I, I am happy to forward. Um, many have noticed that Dram and Ector have amassed stacks of black pallets of crates over six feet high that disturb our protective view corridor so as to seemingly deter or slow would-be thieves that now have been placed on the Sedonia Street Drive as well. It's scary to think that this little amount of hemp is causing so many issues, but we are here and it is a serious issue. Thank you very much for your time. Please consider this emergency ordinance. Thank you. I'm sorry, Alina, um, I just wanted to check, are you um, here to speak on oral communications or only on item 10A, which is the climate action plan? I'm actually going to speak on 10A, climate action plan. Okay, I'll call you during that item. So our final speaker um, under oral communications is Garrett. Garrett, you can uh, start when ready, you have three minutes. Yeah, hi, I am, um, hi everyone. Um, Nice to see you all. Um, I wanted to speak specifically on Ordinance 2020-16. 
Um, so I can go ahead and reserve for public comment on that, if that's okay. Okay, great. I will put you down for that item. So that mayor, that does conclude oral communications. Okay. Uh, thank you to everybody who um, came forward today to speak. Uh, we have in front of us now the consent calendar. Actually, do we have any changes to the agenda? No changes to the posted agenda. And then moving to the consent calendar, I do have public speakers for item 8F. Um, Madam Mayor, if I might interrupt, uh, we will be moving item 8F off of the consent calendar. I'll move the remainder of the consent calendar absent 8F. I'll second. Okay, let's go ahead and vote. Council Member Hubbard? Yes. Council Member Mosca? Yes. Council Member Cran? Yes. Deputy Mayor Hinsey? Yes. And Mayor Blake Spear? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. We can now move to item 8F. And do you want to hear the public speakers first or would you like a staff report? I think a brief staff report would be good, uh, Madam Mayor. Yes, let's have a staff report. Good evening, this is Jennifer Day, uh, the principal planner and advanced planning here at the city. To, good, morning, good evening. So to initiate the solicitation of a request for proposals for the El Camino Real corridor specific plan, as well as to amend the fiscal year 2021 um, adopted budget to appropriate $300,000 um, in LEAP grant funding for the development of a specific plan is what we're here to talk about tonight. So the LEAP grant provides local jurisdictions with a one-time grant funding opportunity for the preparation and adoption of planning documents and to process these improvements. The goal of the program is to accelerate housing production to meet the city's regional housing need assessment. On June 10th, 2020, the city council adopted resolution number 2020-44, which authorized the city manager to apply and receive the LEAP grant funds. The city received their grant award letter on October 16th, 2020. So um, I'll, attached to uh, the staff report is the proposed RFP for the um, El Camino Real specific plan. So the priority goal is the development of a specific plan to create a vibrant, authentic, and pedestrian friendly area that becomes the destination for residents to both live, work, shop, and recreate. The El Camino Real area has previously been looked at for redevelopment opportunities and as a location that could benefit from and be re revitalized by the incorporation of residential units. The successful development of the proposed specific plan will allow for multimodal transit with a mixture of uses, including commercial, office, public, and residential. There are a number of components that are proposed as part of that RFP, including active community engagement, um, as well as the um, completion of an environmental compliance document um, with that specific plan. We're looking to go out with the RFP after approval tonight and to solicit those proposals. And then at the beginning of 2021, um, looking to um, start work um, on this project and we'll come forward back to council with the contract with the selected consultant. And that concludes staff's presentation and I'm available to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. I did have one question actually about the limits of the project. I was concerned that it doesn't go to the south of Encinitas Boulevard, which would include the Sprout Shopping Center, as well as the um, the LA Fitness. And why is it that it it stops there? It doesn't necessarily going to stop at the street being a hard boundary. I we provided those streets as kind of soft boundaries. It would probably also encompass those areas that you're talking about, um, inclusive of those commercial centers. Um, okay. on the opposite side. And so the okay. boundaries are not set yet. That'd be part of the process. Okay. And then that would also potentially include the BMW dealership on Encinitas Boulevard? That's correct. Okay. Okay, good. I'm happy to hear that. Um, Council Member Mosca, did you have a question? I'm going to defer my questions and comments until after public comment. Okay. okay. Uh, let's go ahead and hear the public comment. Okay. Our first speaker is Ruben Flores. 
Ruben, you can start when ready and you do have three minutes. Hi, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to um, city council members and my fellow community members that are listening to this call. Um, I wanna speak about item 8F. Number one, to first of all, to express my enthusiasm for the pursuit of a plan towards rationally developing El Camino Real corridor. I live uh, two blocks from El Camino Real um, and uh, it's a, truly a vibrant, you know, key component of what makes Encinitas a vital city in addition to our coastal range. At the same time that I wanna express my support and excitement for this proposal, I wanna express my um, concerns uh, and I want to uh, ask that everybody uh, proceeds with care in how the proposal and the study is conducted. Uh, I am specifically concerned about preconceived notions of converting specific areas to mixed, dense mixed uh, use as stated in the um, report from staff that is posted on the agenda. Uh, I want to advise that we perhaps proceed with a more open mind and we listen to what the community in this part of Encinitas uh, considers its appropriate development of El Camino Real. I am personally and particularly opposed to densification of El Camino between Garden View in the north and Santa Fe in the south. I think we need to be very careful. I do would like to see some communication and ease of paths between the existing shopping, cent shopping centers and, and ease of use in those shopping centers. I think we have a wonderful opportunity in Locadia and El Camino Real to provide some um, more development where there's plenty of um, <clears throat> uh, shops, plenty of potential uh, land to develop for uh, entertainment and parks. It's close to a park. And <clears throat> I just want to, uh, again, uh, uh, express my gratitude for um, uh, anybody who's taking the initiative to lead this study but also I'll let you know that I, I, would, I, I intend to be actively participating and, and providing my input and feedback as a citizen and for me, former planning commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ron Dodge. Ron, you do have three minutes. You can start when you are ready. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Should I start over? Yeah, go ahead and start right now. Now we can hear you. Okay, um, my apologies. Um, our, uh, good evening, um, Honorable Mayor Blake Spear, Deputy Mayor Henze, Council Members Hubbard, Kranz, and Mosca. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Uh, it's, uh, it's a particular uh, uh, pleasure in these uh, trying times. I'm very pleased that we're making progress uh, addressing El Camino, El Camino Real with the El Camino Real uh, corridor uh, specific plan. I have long looked forward to implementing uh, traffic calming, active uh, transit, uh, um, creating a calmer, welcoming, uh, pedestrian friendly home space along this corridor. And you know, with that in mind, um, you know, we need to bear in mind that the uh, the core the core of the corridor is a 35 miles an hour speed limit, and on either end of the corridor we have these uh, high speed uh, uh, run up zones, and uh, people uh, at either end of the corridor are either coming in from uh, well high speed areas and uh, uh, gradually slowing down uh, well into the into the corridor, um, and. Uh, uh, for example, folks northbound will uh, uh, hit the accelerator at uh, Mountain Vista or uh, Montoro and uh, gradually uh, accelerate uh, downhill toward uh, toward the north and leaving the city. Um, and, and frankly, I think it's uh, you know we we have the, the design of the roadway is designed as a high speed road, um, and despite my being conscientious about it, I still find myself creeping up. Uh, on that 35 mile an hour limit. Uh, this uh, will uh, obviously detract from the um, 
pedestrian friendly nature that we are going to be striving for um, and certainly doesn't make for a calming, uh, uh, welcoming uh, environment. The inclusion of uh, well incorporated affordable housing will um, drive the welcoming and uh, destination nature of the corridor. Also induce traffic calming and, in, uh, and require it for that matter. And the push uh, uh, and push the requirement for um, conventional transit, active transit, and uh, safe pedestrian facilities. Um, not to mention providing much needed housing. We heard about that a little earlier this evening. And addressing uh, it also uh, turns out addressing the uh, the creek. Um, uh, that uh, that is included in the uh, in the work statement, and um, that might even include the assessment from Garden View South, which uh, a goodly portion of it is in a uh, conduit and uh, in a concrete trench. So these are some things to think about and uh, to look forward to with uh, with this effort. And uh, I too look forward to participating. And I'm hoping that we'll be incorporated in comments that uh, Dan Burden made. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public speakers on this item. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Mosca. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this is such an important item. I, I I'm, was very happy that we pulled it and had an opportunity to speak to it and, and have some of our members of the public um, kind of talk to it as well. Uh, it is an important corridor. It is, in my mind, um, one of the most important areas of our city, El Camino Real corridor. Um, it's important for a whole host of reasons. Um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's one of the largest sales tax producing areas for our city. Uh, it's an area that, that uh, many of our residents live around. Uh, and frankly, it's, a, it's an area, area of our city that really hasn't gotten the attention that it so deserves. And it's really kind of a holdover from when we were part of the county uh, and there's kind of a wild, wild west of, of, of planning or the lack thereof. And so, you know, it's important that we're starting to kind of move toward addressing this corridor. We've done a lot as a city council, you know, to, to address some of the things. And, and I think that this next step is an important step. You know, right now we have a uh, uh, Liebenheim Municipal uh, Water District who's working jointly with the city on a pipeline project um, on El Camino Real. And that's kind of uh, uh, cutting up the street a bit, but when they're done, there'll be brand new infrastructure under that road uh, a repaved road, pretty much the whole length, adjusted um, adjusted um, uh, lanes uh, for what Ron was talking about on the northern portions, a mid-block crossing, uh, and a whole host of other features. Uh, and there's a lot of effort that we've been doing to connect a lot of the shopping centers along El Camino Real. So the next step is really kind of to, to bring the community together and really uh, start talking about what our vision is for this corridor for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. What do we envision for this corridor? Because change is going to happen. And how do we get in front of that change and get very specific about what our vision is and what that plan is going to be for that corridor? And see, that that's what I, I see this uh, plan all about, uh, is really kind of uh, maximizing the control for the residents, really thinking about what is our vision uh, and, and we're not going to enter this with some preconceived notion, as Ruben said, you know, though this is a city process, it really is going to be a bottom up approach. We're not going to enter it and saying, OK, this is what we want to do and where we want to do it. But what does the community want? What is the vision of the community? And this is going to be a slow, steady pace that we have with this, really bringing as many people into the fold as possible to capture that vision. Uh, and then ultimately, once we have that vision, have concrete steps that we can take in the fusion future to realize that vision of a of a corridor uh, that is is some a place for residents and visitors to to gather, uh, to shop, uh, to spend time with their family, uh, and and multiple ways of getting around the corridor um, that are that are easy for people. And so that's kind of uh, what I'm thinking. And I'm happy that we're at the step where we can actually get funding uh, to move forward on a specific plan. Uh, and again, this is going to take a couple of years uh, and a lot of uh, feedback from, from residents to put together. Uh, but I'm hopeful at the end that we're going to have a vision that we can really work on for the future and make sure that this corridor uh, looks and feels and functions and in, in a way that it, it deserves to, because it is really one of the most important areas of our city. So thank you. 
And I'll move this item uh, when it's appropriate, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Kranz. And I'll second it and uh, echo many of the comments that Joe just made. Uh, district uh, one and four share a part of El Camino Real and um, District 1 is a very small part of this segment of old county planned uh, development. And the contrast between the north part of Grand View, Garden View and the south is, 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 I think, captures the challenge that we have. On the south side of Garden View, you have Encinitas Creek in a concrete trench. On the north side, you have an open wetland that allows the creek to um, actually function as uh, a filter for the stormwater that we get. And so my expectation is out of this planning process, we will get a lot of input. And it, I think, is a little ironic that we heard from Ruben and Ron, who are neighbors, and I I'm not surprised by that. And I look forward to their active engagement in this. And I think Ruben's experience as a former planning commissioner will be very valuable. I remember uh, uh, the 2009 presentation on the general plan update that essentially put all of the required RENA allocation in the El Camino Real corridor. And I know that set us back a, uh, a decade or so in terms of planning both the general plan and any effort to look at specific planning for this area. So uh, I understand their reservations. Uh, there will be, um, as long as I'm participating in this, no dumping of densification into this area. But with that said, I will also say that any opportunity for redevelopment that might underground utilities and make this uh, southern stretch of El Camino Real corridor more bikeable and walkable is going to be very difficult to do without um, the, the uh, incentives that might come along with redevelopment. So um, ultimately, it's uh, really great to have the community engaged. And I think, as Joe said, that this is a really important document for the decades ahead. And uh, having a good, solid planning document for, um, you know, with a roadmap for how to proceed with, with uh, um, making the improvements that uh, are necessary, uh, I think is uh, really beneficial to the community. So um, I look forward to supporting it and participating in the development of the specific plan. Okay, thank you. I think everything's been said, so um, not everybody needs to say it, right? There's that phrase. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and vote. Okay, Council Member Hubbard. Absolutely, yes. Council Member Mosca? Yes. Council Member Kranz? Yes. Deputy Mayor Hinsey? Yes. And Mayor Blake Spear? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. We can now move to the first action item, which is item 10A, update to the 2018 Climate Action Plan. Okay, great. We'll go to staff first and have our presentation, and then we'll go to public comment. Crystal, we can't hear you. How about now? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry about that. My first time at City Hall in a while. <laughs> I am actually here in the building. Uh, can you see me? I hope so. Yes, we can. We can okay, see you. Great. I will share my screen and get my presentation started. Nice art in the background, too. Thank you. Clearly, I have children. <laughs> um, okay. Can you see my screen, my presentation? Okay, I'll go ahead. So this is for item 10A, the Interim Climate Action Plan Update. And I wanted to introduce a few panelists that we have. Our consultant team is here from the Energy Policy Initiative Center. They helped with the CAP update. 
and that is Nomini Silva Send. She's a, the assistant director of EPIC, and Nichao Gu, she's a technical policy analyst. And then Mark Steele, uh, also a technical policy analyst, is here tonight for any questions that may come up. And so just a reminder that the recommend, recommended action is to adopt the updated climate action plan. I'll go over why we're doing the update. I'll summarize the updates. I'll explain the consultation that staff had with the Environmental Commission, and then go over the Environmental Assessment and CEQA analysis. So why are we updating the CAP? Well, I'm considering this an interim update. In the adopted Climate Action Plan, we have established a five-year update cycle, and it's only been two years since we adopted that CAP in 2018. And, but the reason why we're updating it now is there was a requirement in the housing element update CEQA document. Um, it's mitigation measure GHG-2 that required that we update the cap and include in the cap the potential environmental impacts of the additional housing that will be added as a result of the housing element. So that's the main reason. Uh, there's some other reasons uh, for updating it as well, though, which we are folding in. Uh, since the cap was adopted in 2018, we also completed the active transportation plan. And then also since 2018, there's been new state and federal le legislation and also some new insights based on some of the implementation that we've done for the cap. So the areas that were updated in the cap include the 2012 inventory, the 2030 greenhouse gas emissions projections, the cap measures and the 2030 targets. So a good chunk of the, the cap needed to be updated. So I'll, I'll go over how the housing units were incorporated. So this was the first thing that needed to be done. This was completed by SANDAG. They re-ran our vehicle miles traveled forecast using their model and uh, assumed that all of the units that were uh, established, the additional units established in the housing element update would be built by 2030, so that they would um, be fully incorporated into our, um, our 2030 cap target. This resulted in a population increase and actually a deploy an employment decrease. Uh, so overall, there was a 2% increase in citywide vehicle miles traveled due to the additional units uh, in 2030. And then this slide represents some of the other things that went into the 2030 projection recalculation. So uh, under the, the uh, category of climate data, there's been some new and revised climate data that's come online since 2018 that related to the California vehicle emissions rate. It actually is uh, anticipated to be lower now for 2018, 2030. And then we're anticipating to have a higher renewable content in our, in our electricity, but a lower energy load, both in electricity and natural gas. And then we also have some new data, some new local waste data. Uh, previously, we relied on some statewide data and this local data is more specific to our region. So we incorporated that. And then on the legislation side, there was on the federal side, a relax, relaxation of the vehicle emission standards. However, on the California side, there's been some uh, legislation that's promoting reduction in emissions. And so that includes the increase in renewable standards from 50% to 60% by 2030, an increase in the voluntary participation of solar and energy efficiency programs, some uh, new building energy efficiency standards and a new solar mandate for new residential. So all of this was incorporated into the calculation of the projections and the table on the right shows that result. And so in almost every category, uh, emissions were actually are being reduced and from our, our 2018 cap and the overall total anticipated projection of emissions is actually less. And so with that projection, we compared that projection to our 2030 target. And we actually determined that our current 2030 target will uh, get us to a 
So that revised projection will get us to achieve our target, that in combination with our local cap measures. However, there were some reasons why we still wanted to update our cap measures and I'll go over those. So the first reason was that the active transportation plan is now complete. And in, if you'll recall in the 2018 cap, we had kind of a placeholder measure for the ATP. We listed the ATP, but we were not able to calculate emissions reductions for it because we didn't know the exact projects that would facilitate the, uh, an emissions reduction. So now we know that, and we did that uh, analysis as part of this cap update, and that's been folded into this updated cap. And then uh, there were some revisions to the to almost all of the greenhouse gas reductions. Almost every measure had to be recalculated because of uh, either new activity data or new state or federal regulations, similar to what I re referenced on the previous slide on the projection. And then there were also some revisions based on recent CAP implementation experience from staff. And then also an addition of uh, building decarbonization measures. And this was out of the interest of the Environmental Commission. I'll go a little more specifically into how the CAP measures were revised. So five measures are either being, four of them are being proposed for revision and one is a new measure. So BE1, there's a proposal based on a CAP implementation experience that uh, this measure is actually not feasible for, uh, for staff to implement. It's, it's actually pretty staff intensive and, and resource fiscally and intensive. And so the proposal is to revise this one uh, to be similar, but, uh, but a little different in, wit, in which we would adopt an ordinance to uh, require residential energy efficiency. And this would be similar to the city of Carlsbad's measure that they've already adopted. And then BE2 and BE4 is where uh, the building decarbonization comes into play. So the old cap measures are related to residential solar water heating and commercial solar water heating. So in the implementation phase, uh, it was determined that these two measures are actually not able to be implemented. And that's because the first thing that you need to do in order to adopt a local ordinance for building energy efficiency is to do a cost effectiveness study. This is a requirement by the state. And when doing that study, it was determined that uh, installing solar water heaters in commercial and residential, making having that be a requirement is actually not cost effective for building owners. So we're not able to implement uh, this, these measures as we originally proposed. So the recommendation tonight is to revise these two uh, measures to BE2 would be to require decarbonization of new residential buildings. And then BE4 would be to require decarbonization of new commercial buildings. And then the fourth one being recommended for revision is or really completion is the CET1, which is uh, formerly was to complete and implement the citywide active transportation plan. So the actual measure is not changing, but what we were able to add with this update is, is the metrics for the greenhouse gas reductions, and then also some very limited mode shift goals. So the hope was that we could actually establish mode shift goals for the whole for citywide, but unfortunately, we learned through the CAP update that we don't have the appropriate baseline data to do this. So we, what we were able to do is establish some very targeted mode shift goals just for the areas kind of immediately surrounding the ATP project areas. And then lastly, the only additional CAP measure that's being proposed is MCE2. And that would be to adopt a municipal employee telecommute policy. We've learned of late that that's this is something that is a possibility and could reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In the supporting measures category, we've got a handful of measures that we're proposing to add. And under strategy one, building efficiency, uh, we'd like to add a measure to support state, that, so that the city would support state decarbonization legislation. And that we would also implement education and outreach for on decarbonization and building electrification. Under strategy four, clean and efficient transportation, we'd like to 
um, add more bike parking and infrastructure enhancements for bike biking and walking, do the surveying and monitoring that would be required to establish that, that baseline mode use that I mentioned, and then complete the modal alternatives plan, which is actually the follow on plan to the ATP. And then lastly, expand the city employee alternative commute program to incentivize different ways of commuting rather than uh, single occupancy vehicles. And then lastly, under the zero waste strategy, we will be implementing a paperless online permitting uh, program. And then this slide, this graph summarizes kind of everything I've been talking about all into one visual. So the red dashed line represents the business as usual greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions projection. And so if the city didn't do anything to try to reduce emissions and the state and the federal government didn't do anything, that is the anticipated emissions uh, the projection that we would have out to 2030. The light green line shows the emissions reductions based on state and federal legislation. And then the dark green line is the additional reductions based on the city's measures. And so, and then the, and then the, the black dots are the 2012 inventory, the older inventory, the 2020 target, and then the old 2030 target. And what I wanted to highlight here, most importantly, is that red dot at the very tail end of the of the dark green line that is the proposed in this cap update update the revised 2030 target so what uh what uh, we felt we could do with this cap update is to adjust the 2030 target slightly from 41 percent to 44 percent so that it matches the new trend line uh, with everything kind of all the emissions reductions combined so that's the proposed new 2030 target, which is 41%. <laughs> there we go, energy efficiency in, in action right there, the automatic light shut off. Um, okay, so uh, the consultation with Environmental Commission subcommittee, staff consulted with the CAP subcommittee and, uh, and there were several recommendations that came to that subcommittee that were incorporated into the CAP. And then the draft cap was taken to the Environmental Commission on October 8th, and the commission voted unanimously to recommend that council approve the cap update. And then lastly, the environmental assessment. So there's two ways that CEQA is related to the Climate Action Plan. Number one is the way that I referenced earlier. Uh, these proposed revisions that you're um, are before you tonight would incorporate the effects of the additional dwelling units in the fifth cycle housing element and accomplish the housing element update EIR mitigation measure GHG-2. Additionally, uh, when the 2018 cap was adopted, that included a CEQA analysis uh, that went along with it and a negative declaration was determined at that time. So the, pro the proposed revisions to the cap that are presented to you tonight uh, have been determined to also not result in a significant environmental effect. And so therefore a negative declaration addendum was prepared for the CAP update before you tonight. And just to remind you, the recommendation is to adopt the updated climate action plan with the, by adopting the resolution that's enclosed with the staff report. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for that presentation, Crystal. That was very interesting. Um, I have a couple of questions. So I wanted to ask about the baseline data for our mode shift goals. I know we've talked about this before, but can you just give a little bit more detail about how and when we will be doing that? Yeah, and so yes, we have realized that this is an issue and caused a limitation to the CAP update. And so staff is actually actually actively engaged right now to get consulting services in place before some of our bigger projects go to construction. So namely Streetscape and El Portal. We are looking to get a consultant on board before that happens so that those th that baseline analysis, at least for those two projects, can be done. And then we have a whole list of, kind of projects that are related to biking and walking infrastructure 
that we would also have that consultant do that are happening within this next year. And then the other thing that we we did was in the, the RFP for the circulation element, we folded in a task to do more of a, a full-blown citywide baseline analysis of our biking and walking modes, and then have the consultant for that uh, document actually do the analysis to develop those mode shift goals for us. Okay, good. So what what's the timeline do you expect on, on that? Um, having goals and having baseline, I mean, the circulation mm -hmm. element is a multi-year process, right? I'm not sure how long it will take. Um, I'm not the lead project manager on it, but um, it would be folded into that process. I, I, I don't know positively where in that process it would occur, whether the results couldn't be available until the end, or if there could be some sort of a midpoint on that. Um, so I'd have to get back to you on an exact timing, but it is definitely folded in as a task. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I just want to state publicly to the staff and um, to the public and to my colleagues that I think it's critically important that we prioritize getting this baseline data. We have put a number of active transportation projects into our city that are essentially unquantified, like the new protected bike lane on Highway 101, which has unquestionably resulted in a huge number of people biking and ride and walking to the beach and through through Cardiff to restaurants, to Solana Beach, to other places to the south. And we're just not quantifying that. And I think we're really missing the boat there. So, you know, we're doing a lot of projects that are even just small, they're curb cut projects, they're safe routes to school projects. Um, and they are resulting in people making a different choice, but we, you know, we're continuing to not capture that. So I would really like the professional staff to look at whenever we do a safe route to school project or another project that we do the baseline data capturing right around there. How many kids are walking to school right now before we improve the, the road outside Paul Ecke and then after so that we're, you know, really able to, to quantify that. Right now, also on Vulcan in Lucadia, we're putting in improvements, um, just the extension of a sidewalk in front of a new development that will connect existing sidewalks on either side. And so, you know, that needs to make it into our process as part of our public works process, our engineering process, so that every time there's an increase or uh, an improvement that we're capturing that data and not waiting a couple of years for us to do a, a full citywide survey as part of the circulation element. So I would just like to really highlight that as something that's important. And then the other thing I wanted to ask about is the bike parking, which you, you mentioned. You know, there are several areas that seem to not be getting bike parking quickly. Like for example, after all the sand we put on the beaches in Cardiff at the sand dunes, um, you know, there are two state um, parking lots there and we don't have bike parking. We don't have any rack at outside of Seaside or at um, uh, at either of them, basically. So, what 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 is happening there, and what is the delay that we can kind of break through that and get that? But bike parking doesn't seem that expensive. So, you know, how can we move faster there? Yeah, for that we actually, we do have funding set aside for some bike parking, some. Um, some immediate bike parking in the area that you mentioned and some additional parking in some other impacted areas. Um, I'd say the biggest limitation is that's actually a project on my plate and this getting this cap update completed uh, was a higher priority. So once that's done, once the decision is made tonight, then there'll be more time being allocated to the bike parking issue and getting more bike racks out throughout the city in the beach areas and um, some of the denser areas where we're noticing where we're noticing more bikes traveling lately. Okay. Yeah, I just really want to highlight that South Cardiff State Beach parking lot, which we've, you know, improved the walking path, uh, major improvements all along there. And people's bikes are they're in the sand connected to the um, lifeguard tower. They're, you know, next to the trash cans. I mean, they're just kind of all over the place and it's really not not ideal. Um, so, uh, but thank you for all of your work on this cap update. It's a really exciting to see these things and to see our numbers going down like that. I hope that they can continue to go down and we see that actually happening. That's great progress. So thank you for all your work. Mm -hmm. uh, Council member Mosca. Yeah, just kind of dovetailing off of the mayor's uh, latter comment there. 
you know, um, there's also, I think, lost opportunities. We talk about um, public projects that have moved forward and, and that we don't have um, some bike facilities um, um, or bike racks, I meant to say. Uh, on El Camino Real and other parts of the city, we've seen significant remodels, um, multi-million dollar remodels of, of, of shopping centers and, and no bike racks in any of those. Uh, and so I, I, I do think that when we're talking about some of these kind of um, ideas is, you know, um, things are happening and we're, we're missing some of these opportunities as well. Uh, and so, uh, and I also wanna just, um, the mayor under uh, highlighted, I wanna underline what she said about the, the, the importance of capturing uh, the reduction in emissions. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a quality of life, um, you know, kind of improvement um, for these uh, facilities. Uh, but we're doing them and we're improving the quality of life and we might as well be capturing uh, the reduction in emissions as well. And so I think it's critically important that we're, we're doing that. Uh, and, but, I, but I understand uh, that we're gonna be getting there. So um, I just wanna underline that. Um, Crystal, thank you so much for your presentation tonight and thank you for um, this update. Um, I think you've done a wonderful job with this update. And I think one of the uh, really important aspects of what you've done is that you've really uh, worked with a lot of the, the, the various stakeholders that are really working this space uh, and you've uh, worked in concert with them and, and put together something uh, that is a great document uh, that other folks have uh, really kind of, um, you know, uh, given some really good feedback and, and they believe it's a, a great document as well. And so that's, that really helps us as a city council. Um, I have one question and that, that's regarding uh, BE2, B-2 and B-4. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, moving from what was required under the, the original cap uh, 2018 uh, to this update that we're moving from uh, one requirement to uh, another requirement in terms of decarbonization of new construction for residential homes and commercial. Can you talk to, to us a little bit more about what would, uh, what would be required for new construction in those, both those areas? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And and the, the specifics actually haven't been decided yet. There's various ways that we could go in terms of the level of um, integration of electrification into buildings. There's many different examples in other California cities of different ranges of electrification, everything from a complete ban and no natural gas service to the building to much more minimal things that are just specific to certain appliances like water heating or space heating or cooktops. So there's a, a varying range of things that could be done. And the, the proposal tonight uh, that's included in the CAP update doesn't uh, propose anything specific other than an ordinance related to building electrification. So the details are will be hashed out at once the updates, the direction has been given. And, and we'll, we'll work with uh, stakeholders and interest groups and make sure that what's proposed is something that uh, is supported by uh, the majority of stakeholders and something that council would be comfortable adopting. Good, good. Yeah, so, um, so we'll kind of um, have further conversation about that. And I know that the Environmental Commission has uh, discussed it a little bit. And so would, um, whatever whatever um, staff is coming up with uh, in concert with working with some of the stakeholders, will that go back to the Environmental Commission? Uh, it, what I'm basically alluding to or, or, or wanting to see is just maximum public input um, and allow residents and stakeholders um, the opportunity to, to, to give their feedback and input at every stage uh, so that by the time it comes to the city council, you know, they'll have another opportunity, but, but we've kind of got, gotten closer to uh, a consensus um, kind of option uh, for us to look at. Yeah, certainly. I definitely plan to go to the Environmental Commission. The The idea actually came from the Environmental Commission, so I do certainly want them to be involved in, in the shaping of the proposed regulation. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Councilmember Kranz. Yes, thank you. Um, Crystal, I appreciate all the effort that we made uh, with regard to the Climate Action Plan over the years. I know, um, I recall that uh, your position was created back when uh, 
Council Member Schaefer was serving. And so it has been uh, a while and I appreciate all your efforts. Um, I am uh, going to uh, reemphasize the need for the bike security devices. I know we call them bike racks, but the reality is that for me, it's it's uh, intended to be something that I can lock my bikes to. Um, we bought his and her e-bikes uh, recently, and we very much enjoy uh, riding them. Uh, we went to Carter Beach for a picnic, and there was really nowhere uh, uh, readily available to secure our bikes. And so um, it's a little frustrating. I do enjoy riding and then turning around and coming back, but it would also be nice to be able to stop and not have to worry about uh, my bike being stolen. So um, I hope that the city manager will uh, prioritize that. And while I appreciate your efforts and involvement in that, I think that it might be uh, necessary to involve the public works department and other departments. So um, my hope is that the city manager will, will focus on that as well. Um, I also am looking forward to, I know that mode shifting and automobiles are our greatest emitters of greenhouse gases. And um, so it's really important that we do that, but I'm also looking forward to rolling out the CCE. And I don't know, uh, Joe, whether you'll have the opportunity to make a presentation anytime soon, but um, it would be good to get a clear picture on what the timeline is now that our year has passed and we are close to being able to give our community a choice on energy. So if you could uh, comment on that, I would appreciate it. We're going to have a, I'm, I'm not sure if we'll have a resolution before the city council before the end of the year, but certainly in the beginning of the year, if not before the end of the year, we'll have a resolution before the city council uh, and a discussion for us to decide you know, um, do we want to go with San Diego Community Power's uh, default setting of 50% and gradually work up to that 100% at 2030, which is um, the target for in our climate action plan? Uh, is it 2030 or 2035, Crystal? Ours is 2030. Oh, 2030. Yeah. Um, I, I think other member cities are 2035. Yeah. Um, I think we share the 2030 with IB. Um, and so, um, or or do we basically? Uh, decide uh, to go up to 100% right out of the gate. Uh, and so that that will be uh, a discussion for the city council and 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 every city council actually within the CC would would have to set that um, that default setting uh, by a resolution. So that that will be coming to us soon. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, council member Henzi, did you have your hand up? I had my hand up and then I realized that we haven't heard from the speakers yet. So I'll just wait till after we hear to voice my comments. Okay, let's go ahead and hear from the speakers. Okay, we do have quite a few. We have about 24. Uh, first speaker is Noah Harris. Noah, you can start when ready and you do have three minutes. Saw him there. Hello. There you go. You can start. Great, thanks. Um, good evening, council members. This is Noah Harris, policy advocate with Climate Action Campaign, calling in support of this Climate Action Plan update. I wanna begin by thanking the council and staff for your consistent leadership on climate action throughout the region. And Sunitas has had a strong track record of demonstrated commitment to policies and programs that will re reduce city citywide greenhouse gas emissions towards stopping the climate crisis. The most up-to-date climate science, including the landmark 2018 UN IPCC Special Report on Global Warming, says we must fully transition off of fossil fuels by mid-century to stave off the most devastating impacts of climate change. This CAP update includes two measures requiring electrification of new residential and commercial buildings, a key strategy towards eliminating the, the consumption of climate-harming methane gas which is the third most significant source of emissions in our cities. Tonight, Encinitas has the opportunity to join a growing number of cities across California, leading the charge on building electrification, bringing reduced emissions and clean air, new jobs, and cheaper construction and utility costs for Encinitas families. Please support this CAP update, which will help advance the region towards a zero carbon future. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Rita Clement. Rita, are you on? Rita? Okay. 
Next is Diolinda Montero. Good evening. Mayor. Hello? Yes, you can start. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Blakespear and Encinitas Council members. My name is Diolinda Montero. I'm calling in support of this climate action plan update, which will help ensure that Encinitas remains a healthy, safe, and productive city well into the future. I appreciated hearing about the progress you have made so far. I understand that there will be costs incurred in the years to come and changes will have to be made to systems that have been in place for many years. However, the cost of doing nothing will be catastrophic for the environment as well as the economy. As you move forward with your climate action plan, it is imperative that you consider the economics of these changes as they apply to all affected parties. The path forward must include a just transition for everyone. Mm -hmm. This includes job training for those whose jobs will be at risk of being lost. Your concern voiced earlier this evening for small businesses who are being negatively affected by the pandemic is indicative of your dedication to the health and well-being of the city. And while there is much work to be done to lower greenhouse gas emissions and combat climate change, I am confident that with proper planning and a focus on data, your efforts can be a model for other communities. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Joe Howd. Joe, are you on the line? Okay, I don't see Joe. David Robertson, you're next. You can start when ready and you do have three minutes. No, you both. Go on, go by, go over there, go on, go by. David? I saw him there, it doesn't look like he's there anymore. Uh, Bertha Rodriguez. Hello, are you there? Can you hear me? Oh, okay, David, go ahead. Now you yeah, so, I'm so sorry. Uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you all so much, the mayor, council members, and staff for your public service, uh, for listening to my comments as well as others. Uh, my name is David Robertson, and I'm a volunteer with the San Diego Green New Deal Alliance. Uh, we are a co coalition of 50 local organizations committed to ensuring that our region achieves a zero carbon economy by 2035 in a way that creates good union jobs. I'm speaking in support of IM 10A and the adoption of the 2020 update of the Climate Action Plan for Encinitas. In particular, uh, I would like to express support for the updated building electrification and renewable energy items, which will play a critical role in reaching our climate action plan goals. Um, and I hope as the specifics are planned uh, that the decarbonization of residential and commercial buildings would entail electrification that bans methane gas, the burning of methane gas, mainly to power buildings, um, as was mentioned by NOAA, is the third largest source of emissions in our cities. In addition to lowering greenhouse gas emissions, eliminating methane gas in buildings leads to lower costs for new construction, improved indoor and outdoor air quality, safer energy infrastructure, and the creation of family supporting union jobs. By phasing out climate harming methane gas and by moving forward toward all electric homes and buildings, Encinitas can continue to lead our region on climate. And in implementing this plan, I urge you to prioritize vulnerable populations. And again, the creation of good paying family supporting jobs. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next is Bertha Rodriguez. Bertha, you can start when you're ready. Um, hello. Um, hello, Mayor Blakespear and Encinitas Council members. My name is Bertha Rodriguez. I am an organizer with the San Diego Green New Deal Alliance. I am speaking in support of item 10A and think it is a great example for the entire region to achieve zero carbon. The CAP update will take necessary steps that we need in order to phase out methane gas from our daily lives. With the new building electrification measures, we can create a future where we can live in a healthy and climate safe future. While this is a huge step forward, we urge you all to ensure a fair, tra a fair transition for workers and communities of concern create good family supporting union jobs and ensure that in the process of creation new buildings, you also center the development of affordable and inclusive community powered, um, communities powered by 100% clean energy. With this in mind, we can create a just and equitable future, not only for Encinitas residents, but for the whole region. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next speaker is Sally Kaufman. Sally, you can start when you're ready. Hi, good evening. My name is Sally Kaufman and I am an internal medicine and pediatrics physician here in San Diego. I am here tonight on behalf of the Public Health Advisory Committee with the Climate Action Campaign in support of a climate action plan update for Encinitas. We know that natural gas is harmful in the homes in particular with cooking. We know that it releases nitrogen dioxide, which has adverse lung effects, such as worsening asthma. With knowing this, it makes sense to move towards electrification and alternative energy uses that is not harmful to people's health. In addition, we know the health benefits, both mental and physical, that activities such as walking and biking have on people's health. I've seen this last year with people who do not have these opportunities in their community. Unfortunately, as gyms and other areas for recreation close, I have seen them gain weight, their blood pressure go up and lead to further cardiac risk factors for the future. Conversely, I've had patients come into my office who do have these activities in their communities and have the options for active transport who have been able to lose weight, lower their blood pressure, lower their cholesterol and have more positive effects on their health overall. We urge you to consider supporting this update for the health of your community and I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next speaker is Katie Christ. Katie, you can start when ready. Hello, and thank you for the time. My name is Katie Christ, and I'm a public health researcher at UC San Diego. Uh, also on the board of the County Bike Coalition and a member of the Public Health Advisory Council with Climate Action Campaign. And I'm encouraged to see that the city has included active transportation metrics in its uh, climate action plan update and wanted to express my support for the plan's adoption. As we know, transportation is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in our region. And if we're serious about addressing climate change, we have to give people safe mobility alternatives. But climate change isn't the only crisis that we're facing. Physical inactivity is a public health epidemic that is now responsible for roughly 8% of deaths in the US. So encouraging active forms of transportation like biking and walking have become, has become a key strategy to address this health crisis as the evidence clearly shows that it's associated with a number of improved health outcomes, including reduced risk of mortality, diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. However, we also know it's exceedingly rare, um, despite the fact that roughly half of all car trips in the US are less than two miles in length. We know that protected bike and pedestrian facilities make people feel more comfortable and therefore are more likely to walk or bike, but they also have implications for safety outcomes. A recent study in multiple cities in the US showed that separated and protected bike lanes were the strongest indicator of lower fatality and injury rates across all travel modes, not just biking. Investment in infrastructure that supports walking and biking provides a cost-effective way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions while also improving the health of our communities. It's also critical that these improvements are implemented equitably, ensuring access for low-income populations. So thank you for your commitment to building an active transportation network that will encourage mode shift at a scale that's meaningful for both the health of individuals and the environment. I would encourage you to expand the mode shift goals beyond just the active transportation project areas. And I agree with Mayor Blake Spear that it's critically important to evaluate the impact of these projects. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ian Harrison. Ian, you can start when you're ready. Hello, Mayor Blakespear and council members. My name is Ian Cody Harrison. I live in District 2 of Encinitas and I'm calling as the owner of a local small business operating in the environmental and social impact sectors. I'd like to express support of this Encinitas Climate Action Plan update, although I would prefer to see a plan that does far more to address our environmental crises. Uh, I also have a question I would like to pose to the council and hope you all will carefully consider for future CAP updates. Why does the IPCC 2019 Special Report on Climate Change and Land state that wetter soil decreases the severity of heat waves 
with high scientific confidence and that increased vegetation reduces regional warming with medium scientific confidence, yet these potential pressure points for stabilizing regional climate don't seem to be making it into the climate action plan as far as I can tell. And these are just two of the non-greenhouse gas pressure points mentioned in this IPCC report to keep this question somewhat digestible, but there are several others. And I would be happy to provide that uh, report to anyone and it's of course accessible online. Thank you very much for your time and public service. Thank you. Next speaker is Lane Sharman. Lane, are you on the line? I don't see his name. Lane? Okay, we'll move to Dr. Angie Nelson. You can start when ready. Hi, good evening, and thank you for taking the time to address this uh, much needed important topic in making uh, history and climate action changes. I'm a family and preventative medicine physician with Sharpree Steely. Many of my patients and colleagues live in Encinitas. Um, in my practice, I talk a lot about health and wellness. And over the last eight months, it's become increasingly clear that I'm hearing patients talk more about air quality, which I thought was strange. People downloading the um, air quality index app to check whether their kids are safe to go outside and play checking the air quality to plan for a jog or a bike ride or even a hike. One particular patient of mine who lives in Encinitas comes to mind. She was diagnosed with COVID-19 in August. She had been quarantined for most of the month. She is a healthy patient who runs and bikes daily. As expected with COVID-19, she experienced shortness of breath that lingered longer than expected. However, despite her recovery you know, going well, the fires and smoke in September started and then that prolonged her symptoms even further. When I last spoke to her, she said, what bothered her the most was not the physical symptoms, but because she's a mom and has used her runs during this pandemic as a daily mental break, her mental health had also suffered. Her stress levels were higher. She also found a new worry she never had. If her lungs were affected, then how does that distress affect her small child? And as a family physician, I know the importance of recovery from inflammatory processes caused by conditions like respiratory infection, cardiorespiratory distress, but more importantly, stress and mental health that compound over inflammation over a lifetime. So with this patient's case, I couldn't help but think that I have many other patients with underlying conditions and are also impacted by the recent fires and future deterioration of air quality caused by climate change. I hope that this highlights a bit of how the recent fires impacted your residents, and if my patient who has a lifelong runner was affected by these conditions, um, I want you to think about all the little children that live in Encinitas and how we want to improve their future. So today I'm standing as a mother, a physician, and an advocate for all the families where climate action cannot wait another year. Please, please lead the way for others to adopt the same. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carl Eldinger. Carl, you can start when ready. Hello, my name is Carl Eldinger and I'm an organizer for the Sierra Club. Recently, somebody told me they didn't know anyone who was in love with their gas water heater. Truth be told, gas water heaters do not spark joy for people. They do not but they do account for half of home's emissions from natural gas in Encinitas. And they're easily replaced under new construction with ultra efficient high uh, heat pump water heaters. How efficient? 3.7 times as efficient as the best thermal electric water heater engineers could ever design. And heat pump water heaters are more than five times the efficiency of a high quality gas water heater. Energy saved through efficiency is energy we do not have to produce, accelerating our transition to 100% renewable energy. Highly efficient air source heat pumps replace gas furnaces without spewing emissions that are hazardous to our health and our future. Electric appliances will also allow smart grid triggered demand response in the future as we work to decarbonize our spaces and strive for efficiency and challenges that we face with peak demand. 
The Sierra Club is in strong support of additions made in the clim updated climate action plan regarding new construction, building electrification, and increased efficiency standards. I would like to add that we support the all electric without exceptions ordinance gas uh, ordinance option or gas ban ordinance option over electric preferred option as mentioned in the new cap when council works to adopt new reach codes in the near future. Our communities are already beginning an important retirement of fossil fuels and saddling homeowners with the costly run of gas pipes for an already obsolete energy source is not good planning. The 2020 version of California's Title 24 of the building code already requires solar panels on the new home's roofs. So future homeowners and builders who supply them already and are in perfect position to enjoy low cost solar electricity plus all electric appliances that utilize that renewable electricity. Any additional electric usage that all electric homes bring can be covered with additional solar panels to compensate all at the lowest overall cost to the consumer. We appreciate council's support for plans uh, that ensure a livable future in Encinitas and all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is, is it V or Vi Nugent? Nguyen? You can start when ready. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes, hello. it's uh, V like the letter, win like you win a game. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the council. Uh, my name is V Nguyen and I'm a general pediatrician in San Diego. Um, I'm also the assistant chief of pediatrics at Kaiser and a member of the public health advisory committee for climate actions campaign. I'm speaking today as a private citizen. Every day I come to work, I feel grateful to do what I do. I take care of about 2000 little people and these little people are the most important people to their parents. It's a huge responsibility that I take very seriously. As a pediatrician, I'm also by definition a child advocate. I have been working on pediatric asthma for over a decade at Kaiser. Um, unfortunately, despite our near perfect weather, San Diego has very poor air quality compared to other places in the country. It's an insidious thing that has been caused by wildfires, car exhaust, or warmer days that leave our air more stagnant. Um, poor air quality, including indoor air pollution, affects children more than adults. Air pollution impairs lung development in children and contributes to asthma burden. Um, it also causes oxidative stress and inflammation that contributes to decreased lung function for pediatric asthma patients, but even adults and with, with supposedly normal lungs. And children, it's funny, they're more vulnerable to pollution just because they breathe more air relative to their size. And they're at greater risk for harm because their bodies and organs are small and they're still developing. Um, Encinitas is a leader in our region for climate action and turning the tide on climate change. I'm here to urge the council to support um, Encinitas' CAP update. Um, it's a vital step to ensuring a livable planet for our children. Overall, it'll set the standard for the rest of Southern California. And I firmly believe you'll be a catalyst for the other um, areas in our county. And also just, just, just for the short term, it's just gonna make the air cleaner for your new children who are gonna be living in these beautiful new Encinitas homes. So thank you so much. And um, I, as I always tell people, try to think like a pediatrician. Thank you. Our next speaker is Max Lubavitz. Max, you can start when ready. Hi, good evening council and congratulations, Mayor Blake Spear and other council members on your reelection. Uh, my name is Max Lubavitz. I moved to Antonis from Los Angeles four years ago. I'm currently living in Lucadia, working for a technology company in Solana Beach. And I'm a volunteer at San Diego 350, a local climate action organization. Uh, I also want to thank Crystal for uh, sharing your presentation. Um, we're in support of um, the enhancements that you're looking to make to the climate action plan. And we look forward to seeing the uh, specifics on what decarbonization will entail. Um, we're also excited to see that building electrification is included in the, in the action plan and transitioning to gas um, from gas to all electric homes, offices, and commercial buildings is essential to meet the Encinitas greenhouse gas reduction targets and make building energy efficient. Building electrification will make our homes and workplaces healthier and safer. Gas combustion in our heating systems and appliances produces air pollution that can have both acute and chronic health effects. Um, I currently live in an older building uh, that has cinder block walls, so we're forced to use the um, gas heater um, during the winters. And I can attest to some of the 
health effects that I felt from this. In fact, we've actually invested in some high caliber uh, air filters um, to offset the uh, the effects of, of the uh, noxious gas that we're seem to be breathing all the time here. And so um, we're definitely pushing for more electrification. Um, and if there's anything we can do to support you guys or help you guys, please let us know. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is James Wong. First, uh, a little disclaimer. I am on the Environmental Commission, but tonight I'm speaking as a Cardiff resident. Now, I'm also on the Commission's CAP subcommittee, and uh, I don't know, perhaps I can speak as a subcommittee since I am its sole member. Anyway, I urge you to please approve this update. Now, our Climate Action Plan is already top ranked and wins awards, as you know, but with these updates, it will be even better. I'm especially pleased to see that it includes building decarbonization. Now, decarbonization has only recently become feasible because of new and innovative developments that were not available even a short time ago. And given the gravity of our current climate situation, it's just the kind of progress that we need to do to avoid a serious crisis. And I'd like to see Encinitas leading the way towards a safer, healthier, and cleaner world. Now, I'm really pleased and proud of what our city has accomplished on environmental fronts. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And this will be yet another triumph. So let's show other cities what we all can and should do. Finally, let me say that the entire CAP subcommittee thanks CAP Administrator Kristen Nahara and EPIC for the knowledge, research, and authorship of the CAP in this update. So. Once again, please approve this update. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Gary John. Gary, you can start when ready. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mayor Blakespear and Council, thank you for this opportunity to comment on the interim cap update. Um, as you heard, my name is Gary Johns. I live in New Encinitas, and I am speaking for my Encinitas teammates in the Sierra Club's My Generation campaign. <clears throat> Our team is working for a livable future, and for that reason, we strongly support this CAP update. Ms. Nahara just gave a great presentation of how experience has led to big revisions of greenhouse gas projections, many of them due to technical advancements. A key example of this new technology that was used for uh, some of the new projections is heat pump water heaters. Uh, Carl Aldinger just mentioned uh, something about this. I'll repeat a little of that. They are three and a half times as efficient as thermoelectric water heaters and five times more efficient than gas. This is a big deal. Half of natural gas usage in a typical home is for heating water. There are numerous other revisions in this, in this CAP update that incorporate new achievable efficiencies like this. It shows that we can live comfortably without generating greenhouse gases. Uh, <clears throat> I would like uh, to talk a little bit about chapter three. It's titled Greenhouse Gas Reduction Strategies, Goals, and Actions. Uh, the goals are itemized in tables there as BE one through four uh, for building efficiency and RE one through three for renewable energy. We strongly support the BE and RE updates because they are more aggressive in addressing the climate emergency we find ourselves in. However, we can see a few places where we would really like you to go further. In BE2, the decarbonization of new residential buildings, we are glad to see the requirement expressed as a call to adopt an ordinance. However, an ordinance to electrify new homes is not the same as one for all electric homes you could end up uh, with houses that are stubbed out for all electric appliances, but, but implemented with all gas. So we ask you to please reword BE2 to say new residential buildings to be all electric instead of electrification of new residential buildings. Uh, another item, BE3, we note that it requires you to evaluate adopting an ordinance, unlike BE1, 2, and 4, that require you to adopt an ordinance. Uh, this may be a minor point. We hope the intent is the same and not a reluctance to act, 
To clarify, we ask you to please change evaluate to adopt. So in closing, we strongly support the cap update before you because I, I hate to say it, the last four years have been a failure of our nation to act and now we must act quickly and decisively. We can be effective at our local level, both by example and by doing our share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Christine James. Christine, you can start when ready. Hello, council members. My name is Dr. Christine James, and I am a member of the Public Health Advisory Council of Climate Action Campaign. I am commenting in support of the Encinitas Climate Action Plan update. Firstly, I applaud the council's recognition of climate change as an urgent issue that must be addressed. For physicians, climate change is a public health crisis, and we see its damaging effects on our patients regularly. As an allergist immunologist, I care for people of all ages with chronic respiratory diseases like asthma and COPD. With COVID-19, many of my patients have stayed indoors in order to minimize their chances of acquiring this disease. However, their exposure to indoor air pollutants like methane gas from their gas stoves and other appliances also pose a risk in worsening their breathing control. Fortunately, the CAP update includes building electrification measures that would help to reduce greenhouse gases like methane, the third largest source of emissions in our region. Interventions like ensuring electrification of new buildings would go a long way in helping to safeguard the health of my patients. This is why I am asking you, the Encinitas City Council, to strongly support this update and act on climate because my patients and their families deserve a climate safe future. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Thomas Conrad. Thomas, you can start when ready. Thomas. Hi, can, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So my name is Thomas. Uh, I'm a, a fourth year undergrad at UC San Diego, um, and I'm calling today to speak in support of agenda item 10A, um, that y'all vote yes to approve the update to the climate action plan. Um, and the reason why is basically because, um, you know, uh, building uh, emissions, emissions from buildings, both residential and commercial account for almost uh, a quarter of uh, California emissions. And, um, building electrification can reduce those emissions by up to 90% by 2050. Um, in addition to a lot of the great points that my um, uh, that the speakers before me have, have, have noted, um, I just want to also add, add that uh, building electri electrification can generate, um, you know, more than 100,000 construction and manufacturing jobs annually in, in California, um, even after accounting for modest declines in, in gas industry employment. Um, and there's no reason that those can't be good union jobs with good benefits and good wages and 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 um, uh, local um, hiring local workers in our communities. Um, so I see this as a win-win uh, for Encinitas and, and for San Diego more broadly. And, and I'd highly encourage uh, you all to support uh, the update uh, in this agenda item 10A. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Malika Marsden. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, Mayor Blakespear and council members. My name is Malika Marsden. And I am co-director of policy at Climate Action Campaign, which is also a member of the San Diego Green New Deal Alliance. We are here to urge you to pass the CAP update as um, presented. As Noah mentioned previously, climate science says we must achieve zero carbon to avoid climate catastrophe. And to accomplish this, we must transition away from our third largest source of emissions, methane gas. There is no way around it, and it is critical that we start now. But as we transition away from methane gas and other harmful pollutants, we must also work to do so in a way that ensures a just transition for workers and communities of concern. And we look forward to working with you to find solutions to prioritize vulnerable communities, support workers displaced by this transition, and create good, green, family-sustaining union jobs. We applaud Encinitas for taking this critical step, 
and for continuing to lead the region in climate action that meets the scale and scope of the climate emergency. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tara Hammond. Tara, you can start when ready. Tara, you just need to unmute your, um, unmute your mic. There you go. Good evening, Mayor Blake Spear and members of the council. My name is Tara Hammond. I'm an Encinitas representative for San Diego Communities Powers Community Advisory Committee. And I'm here tonight speaking on behalf of my company, Hammond Climate Solutions, which is working to stop the climate crisis. I am also speaking to encourage you to support the CAP update. You have a unique opportunity tonight to set the precedent for San Diego County by taking a crucial step towards achieving zero carbon. I'm excited to see that this CAP update includes building electrification measures as all electric new construction is something that I support since it lays the foundation for a future with clean air as well as sustainable homes and businesses for the community. As Encinitas moves towards all electric buildings, I urge you to prioritize communities of concern and ensure the creation of local family sustaining union jobs. Please support this CAP update which will be a milestone that helps the region move towards an essential strategy for a just and livable future. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Mary Yang. Mary, you can start when ready. Madam Mayor, council members, my name is Mary Young and I serve on the board of Climate Action Campaign and I am currently a member of the Solana Beach Climate Action Commission. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of serving as a judge on your environmental awards program, which I think is a truly wonderful program. And I've also had the pleasure of working closely with Jim Wong, a truly exceptional individual. I'm really excited to be here tonight to speak in support of your climate action plan update and the building electrification measures it includes. Research has found that electrifying buildings is the lowest cost, most effective and feasible way to cut fossil fuel usage. The, the California Energy Commission has identified building decarbonization as a core strategy to combat the climate crisis. In addition to energy efficiency, a 62 page UCLA study, thank you Thomas Conrad, has found that electrifying California's buildings by 2045 would create 100,000 full-time workers in the construction industry. Building electrification is also good for public health as recent publications have shown that pollutants from indoor gas appliances can increase rates of respiratory illness, cardiovascular diseases, premature deaths, deaths and susceptibility to viruses. Two of the previous speakers have spoken about heat pump water heaters. And I just replaced my gas uh, water heater with a heat pump water heater. In addition to electric um, um, energy efficiency, it also works um, in reverse like a refrigerator. And so in the summertime, it serves to cool my garage. So that's another benefit. In any case, this climate action plan update demonstrates the leadership of your city. And I know that cities in the region will be looking at your cap as an example and for more information and guidance on building decarbonization. I urge you to please adopt resolution 2020-98 and this climate action plan update. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alina Jun-Nawabi. Hi, um, it's actually pronounced June, Alina Jun-Nawabi. I am oh, with uh, CARE San Diego, and I want to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, I'm not from the city of Encinitas, however, I have constituents that I work for from the city of Encinitas. 
as you know, with the whole pandemic and all this climate change that's happening, it's very important that we really prioritize this uh, uh, this app that we have just talked about. The updated version is amazing because this will benefit not only just the community itself, but this will benefit the entire city of San Diego. I'm hoping that city of Encinita could be an amazing example for the rest of us to follow. I think you guys are doing an amazing job. Again, thank you so much for everything you guys have done. And just implementing that, that would just increase the visibility of Encinita. And we really appreciate if you can actually prioritize this uh, uh, yeah, climate uh, action plan. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Laura Nina Cho. Yes, thank you. I'm assuming you can hear me. Yes. Hello, Mayor Blake Spear and Encinita City Council members. My name is Laura Mina Cho, and I'm a volunteer with the San Diego Green New Deal Alliance, and I'm calling to support this updated climate action plan. Why am I involved? I've evacuated more than four hurricanes in Florida, including Wilma and Katrina. And I know you don't have hurricanes, but you do have fires. And I do know what it's like to evacuate natural disasters. As you know, natural disasters are the product of climate change. And we need to get this problem of climate change under control, not only for ourselves, but for future generations. And the best way to do this is to push for a zero carbon future. And it's gonna take many steps. And one big step is through this building electrification. We need to get rid of this extra methane gas. It's the third largest source of emissions in this re region. And it's a big contributor to the climate crisis. Electrification, as you know, it promotes building in a manner that's healthy, safe, and climate friendly for all. So we support the Encinitas CAP update and it's promotion and groundbreaking electrification measures. Encinitas has the ability to be on the forefront of a new push for change and be a leader for all. We urge you to adopt the new updated climate action plan. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, Bruce Becker, I just wanted to confirm, did you wanna speak after all or you still don't wish to speak? Bruce? Yes, thank you for the opportunity, but the other members of the Public Health Advisory Council Climate Action Campaign are doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Bruce. That does conclude oral com or that does conclude comments on this item, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, we did have one question from um, Ian about wet soil and trees and uh, why, why that wasn't included. Do you, do you happen to know the answer to that, Crystal? It was, you said wet soil entries, is that what you said? Yeah, he was referring to a document that um, was recommending or included the, those details. Do you remember his comment? Um, I don't, there were many comments. I'm sorry, I'm not recalling that one specifically. All right, uh, I just, I, but I, I can mention that we, one of the things that I didn't, didn't rise to the level of getting in the presentation, but uh, we did modify the, carbon sequestration measure to double the amount of city trees that we'll be installing by 2030. So previously the goal was to install 50 new trees every year. And now we're, we've been consistently installing over 100 trees for the past few years. And so we feel comfortable that we can double that rate and uh, achieve more installation of trees and sequester more carbon. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call on the deputy mayor now because she was uh, going to comment before the speakers and now it's after the speakers. Thank you. Yeah, so those are some great comments and I'm really happy to hear that there's so much support for what we're doing and I hope that we can just keep up this momentum and continue moving in this direction because clearly it's much needed. Um, there were some things that stood out to me in the climate action plan that I hope are low hanging fruit for us because with so many people biking, um, it just makes sense. And one example that stood out to me was to include the bike sensors and the road markings to indicate the location of the sensor. And um, I think that would just be something easy that we could do that would be really helpful. Um, I'm fully in support of all of those uh, opportunities to measure the baseline, baseline um, for walking and biking. And I hope something 
something Christine Schindler always reminds us of, especially at our um, school district liaison committee meetings, is how important programming is when we couple that with the improvements that we do. And so there seems to be this process that we can start getting down really well, which is the a public input, the baseline, the infrastructure update, and then the programming around it so that we're educating people and students how to use these new infrastructure updates. So I really hope, I know we had a lot planned this year, but COVID kind of wiped all of those events out. And so I hope that we can continue to do that in a virtual way, or we can do it um, together once we're able to do that. And I know uh, we had an email from Teresa Barth, former mayor, who mentioned that Circulate San Diego has recently acquired some grants for bike education. And so I hope that we are able to apply for those and have that activation in the city. Um, I wanted to get bike parking on the list for D Street and Beacons because those are places where we get an email uh, every week about somebody wanting to see bike parking there. And just the last major thing that, well, actually there's two more things. And one is that we have a shuttle as part of our um, climate action plan. And being that we're on the verge of updating our circulation element, I know that there are these awesome little electric shuttles that don't fit a bunch of people, but they're, they really move around fast. And I hope that we can bring our, I guess the process here would be bring down our speeds on our major arterials so that we can actually have these little shuttles on the major arterials. So that might take, you know, redesigning those roads in some way, which most of them do have plans to be uh, redesigned. Santa Fe is a great example. Bring down the speed limits and then actually implement the shuttle system um, around the same time that we're seeing some of these larger high density uh, developments come through. So I hope that we're paying attention to that and, and the way that we get there. And then um, one person wrote to us about considering protections for mature trees. And that's something that surprised me time and again, um, serving on council is that we, we don't seem to have an ordinance that protects our mature trees. And um, I'm just wondering why that might be and if we, you know, how we would initiate that as part of our climate action plan in the future. Okay, okay Crystal, did you want to answer that or? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was a question. <laughs> yes, uh, I know we have an urban forest management plan and I, I, I don't know exactly how it, it, it addresses mature trees specifically but we do have a plan to manage all of our urban trees and ensure that they're as healthy as possible to, to have as long of a life as they can. Um, but I'm not sure it singles out mature trees. So I could get back to you on that. Um, and it's, you know, something we could add to the climate action plan in the future if, if there was an interest. I know Tony Kranz can probably speak volumes of this, but, but I can say that within my time that I've been responsible for expanding the budget of pruning our trees and our, our tree canopy throughout the city. So I think that goes a long way in, in preserving those those pres, uh, those mature trees is making sure that we're taking care of them. And this city council has shown uh, that that's the, their values and that's something that we've been doing. I think we spend over a million dollars a year just in pruning and uh, fixing up the trees. Yeah, that's true. Um, I know we really care about our trees and the street trees, I mean, there's a difference between private trees because that impl implicates private property rights and, and then public trees. Um, I just wanna say thank you to all the members of the, of the different communities and the public that came out to speak on this. I know you're spending your evening um, listening to our council meeting and you know we do uh, pride ourselves on being such an environmental city and we care about this deeply and hearing all the different voices that have come forward to advocate for this update also just reinforces how important this is to the community. So I wanna say thank you to everybody who spoke tonight and came from a place of passion and public health and ultimate sustainability for our planet and our community. Um, so uh, I'm gonna call on my two colleagues again, but we do have other items on the agenda that are uh, time consuming. So I'm gonna ask you to uh, try to limit your comments to the extent possible so we can be moving on here. So uh, council member Kranz. Thanks. Very quickly, um, yes, we have made significant investments in our urban forest, and I would like to say that one of the things that we should be looking at is um, uh, doing less pruning. And uh, in order to do that, we would need to have the cooperation of West Coast Arborists because their model 
says prune, prune, go visit a tree and prune it. And um, I think that it's uh, a, an approach that they have been instrumental in adopting in many jurisdictions around the state. And it's, it's uh, one that I think needs revisiting because we're taking very uh, healthy uh, branches off and uh, losing that capability of carbon sequestration while also using um, tools that uh, contribute to greenhouse gases with uh, chainsaws and big trucks. So um, I would ask that uh, that be an area of focus for Crystal and her team. Are there ways that uh, uh, the Assistant City Manager, Mark Delin and the Urban Forest Advisory Commission Committee would uh, be able to maybe look at alternatives to prune, prune, prune? Yeah, we could take a look at that and see if there's a possibility of, you know, where it's safe to do so, limiting pruning. And I recognize safety is critical and, uh, you know, there's a risk management factor here, um, but the reality is that um, we're, it's very, or it, it's most likely true that we are taking too many branches off. Okay. Yeah, Council Member Cransom, we are trying to be more judicious about that. And instead of just a pure grid pruning where everything gets pruned back severely, uh, severely uh, West Coast Arborist is supposed to be evaluating the trees prior to pruning. That's and, great. And so I just uh, would ask that you continue to monitor that and, and let me know if you think we're making any headway in that. Okay, we will do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Mosca. Yeah, I'm not going to repeat everything that's been said. There's been some really uh, good comments, and I'm looking forward to the future conversations on some of the implementation documents that will come before us in the future. Um, I did want to say that how proud I am to be a part of this team uh, that's moving the dial. Uh, I, and when I say team, I mean not only my city council colleagues, but the entire staff. Um, you know, without your help, we wouldn't be able to do this. And so I'm proud to be a part of this team, proud to be a, a, a member of you know, a city uh, in the in the, all of the cities of state of California and throughout the nation that have made such a big difference on this issue. Uh, and now we're on the, the, the precipice of, of uh, seeing some national action. So, you know, we as cities have kind of uh, have, have put together a kind of a roadmap uh, and the nation is now, you know, kind of engaged in, in, in uh, cities are gonna lead the way and help the nation really kind of adopt uh, priorities and, and, um, and goals and policies for the national level, which would truly make such a big uh, um, difference in this issue. So I'm happy uh, and thrilled that we're up updating this. And, and as the speakers have said, uh, this is going to be a model document for other cities. Uh, and it's not only about what we're going to do locally, but it's also going to have an impact throughout a region, throughout our state. And who knows, maybe, um, maybe uh, throughout the, the nation as well. So thank you. And I'll, I'll move this uh, item as well. Okay, I'll second it. So let's go ahead and vote. Okay, just give me a moment here. Uh, Council Member Hubbard? Yes. Council Member Mosca? Yes. Council Member Kranz? Yes. Deputy Mayor Hinsey? Yes. Mayor Blakespear? Yes. A motion carries unanimously. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, to everybody and we'll move on to the next item. So this is item 10B. Group Homes Regulation Introductory Ordinance. All right, um, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Jennifer Gates, Project Planner for tonight's presentation on the Group Home Permit um, Proposed Ordinance. So the group homes are being used as supported living environments for persons who are considered handicapped as defined by our fair housing law. These facilities are not licensed nor regulated by the state and can be regulated by local jurisdiction. The city currently allows group homes and sober living homes under residential care facilities. This is not a new use in the city. This ordinance proposes a permit process to regulate the operation of these uses. With an increase in the number of sober living homes operating in single family residential neighborhoods throughout the state, concerns have been raised by residents regarding adverse impacts these facilities can have, especially if clustered in close proximity. 
To address these concerns, City Council directed staff in 2015 to proceed with an ordinance to regulate group home permits similar to the ordinance in Costa Mesa. Currently, group homes and sober living facilities serving six or fewer individuals are currently allowed in all residential zones without any regulations or requirements for a permit as they currently are grouped under the definition of a residential care facility within our municipal code. A conditional use permit major is required for facilities serving seven or more, which will continue with these amendments. While jurisdictions are allowed to regulate unlicensed facilities, such as group homes and sober living facilities, it is not able to regulate licensed residential care facilities serving six or fewer. The direction by city council was to create regulations around group home permits and sober living facilities using Costa Mesa as that model. The proposed ordinance creates regulations intended to preserve the residential character of our neighborhoods while furthering the purposes of federal and state laws protecting fair housing. First, by ensuring group homes are entitled to the accommodation provided under this municipal code, limiting secondary impacts, providing accommodations for handicapped individuals that are reasonable to the um, opportunities afforded to non-handicapped individuals to use and enjoy a residential dwelling unit, as well as providing a comfortable living environment for all residents and neighbors that will enhance the opportunity for handicapped individuals to be successful in their program. In May 2015, City Council directed staff to prepare the draft or, or regulations that will govern group home and sober living facilities. This was presented to Planning Commission, which recommended approval of the draft ordinance in August of 2015 and presented to City Council in September of 2015. The ordinance at that time was introduced. However, a second reading was delayed pending lawsuits that were currently active in Costa Mesa. In November of 2018, City Council directed staff to delay moving forward with the ordinance until the City of Costa Mesa's status, um, pending status of their active lawsuits. This year, the City of Costa Mesa successfully defended several legal challenges to its sober living ordinance. As a result, staff brought the matter back before Planning Commission to consider adopting provisions, um, to consider adopting these provisions. On September 3rd, 2020, Planning Commission meeting, they unanimously recommended approval of the draft ordinance with modifications. Some of these modifications included changes from the term occupant to resident consistently throughout the ordinance, clarification that group residential in the zoning code does not include group homes, modified the notice of an application to be mailed from 10 days to 14 days prior to issuance of a group home permit, and the word limited was added to group home and sober living homes when referencing homes of fewer than six residents and general for homes with seven or more residents consistent with the residential care definition. All modifications are visible and track changes on attachment two of the staff report in the PC resolution. The state regulates and licenses certain types of treatment facilities and provides that these licensed facilities for six or fewer individuals cannot be treated any differently than other family dwellings. However, unlicensed facilities can be regulated as long as the regulations do not discriminate. In addition to certain protections from planning, zoning, and land use regulations, recovering alcoholics and drug addicts are also protected under federal and state disability laws because persons suffering from an addiction are considered disabled or handicapped. Both state and federal laws requiring jurisdictions to make reasonable accommodations in their application of zoning laws and other land use regulations, policies, and procedures when such accommodations are necessary to afford persons with disabilities that opportunity to seek equal access to housing. Allowing the operation of group homes provides that accommodation. Currently, the city municipal code defines these facilities that provide recovery and treatment services for six or fewer persons with a disability as a residential care limited. This use is permitted by right in all residential zones in the city. The municipal code also currently regulates the facilities that provide these same services to seven or more persons with a dis disability as a residential care general. 
This use is permitted in all residential areas and the public semi-public zone with approval of a conditional use permit. The city's regulations do not expressly differentiate between state licensed and unlicensed facilities. And it does not currently regulate group homes or sober living homes facilities or require the issuance of a permit or other city approval for the operation of these uses. So the draft ordinance before you tonight, 2020-16, provides for amendments and new chapters in the Encinitas Municipal Code the specific plans and the local coastal program that creates a new permit definitions and land use st standards for the operation of a group home. The draft ordinance starts on page 14 of our staff report, which adds begins with it adding reasonable accommodation requests and group home permits to the list of applications that are reviewed and approved by the director of development services. In addition, the ordinance uh, proposes to add a new chapter 9.39 um, for group home permits, which includes a number of sections for requirements and operations of group homes. The proposed ordinance identifies the application requirements and the process for the issuance and requires that a group home permit be, is required to operate a group home in a sober living facility. The director will issue the permit as a ministerial determination if the applicant is in compliance with or has agreed to comply with all the provisions of the ordinance. At least 14 days prior to issuing a group home permit, the director shall cause written notice of application to be mailed to the owner of record and occupants of all properties within 500 feet of the location of the group home. The request shall be processed independently of any other required development permit. In granting a request for a group home permit, the director may impose conditions of approval reasonable, deemed reasonable and necessary to ensure that the group home permit would comply with the requirements of the chapter and chapter 30.17 of our municipal code. All decisions of the director are posted at city hall and would become effective 15 days thereafter unless a timely appeal is filed. This chapter also establishes the operation requirements that must be followed to have a permit. Some of these operation requirements are listed on the slide before you, and they include such as a house manager to be present at the home on a 24 hour basis, which would be responsible for day to day operations, as well as that the resident would be limited to one vehicle that would be used for their primary form of transportation. In addition, there are um, additional operation requirements for sober living facilities, and these include the ones that you see before you, um, including all residents other than the house manager must be actively participating in established recovery programs. In chapter 9.39, there's a section for permit denial and revocation and of an issued permit. And these are listed before you and uh, more details are provided within the ordinance. But some examples are if there is a material misrepresentation or misleading information included in the application um, or that the um, owner or operator would accept residents in the, the group home other than the house manager who are not handicapped. This ordinance also includes amendments to chapter 30.04, our definition section. In there, there was definitions provided for residential care facility and group residential. And the amendments include separation of group homes from those definitions, as well as to clearly define that residential care facilities are facilities that are state licensed and are defined within our state laws. Other amendments um, within this, and chapter are to reference our specific state law um, but as they apply. In addition, there are new definitions which were added to clarify terms that would be associated with group homes, including group home and sober living home, integral facilities and handicapped. Group homes and sober living homes are intended to provide housing only and not medical care services or treatment. 
All amended and new definitions can be found on pages 23 to 26 of the staff report. The zoning use matrix, matrix and use sections and tables within the downtown North 101 corridor Encinitas Ranch and Cardiff by the Sea um, specific plans are being amended to include group homes and sober living homes. Group homes, including sober living homes serving six or fewer residents are permitted to locate in all residential zones consistent with the existing provisions governing residential care limited uses. Group homes, including the sober living homes serving seven or more residents are permitted in all of the residential areas with approval of a conditional use permit consistent with the existing provisions governing our residential care general. So the ordinance also proposes adding a chapter on group homes within the zoning code with additional land use regulations. And these are listed, uh, some of which are listed um, before you on the slide. And these include that a group home would not be permitted within an ADU unless the primary dwelling unit is used for the same purpose. And that there is a 650 foot uh, separation buffer that must be maintained from any other group home, sober living home, et cetera as measured from the closest property line. The city council has received a number of comments regarding group homes and sober living facilities for tonight's meeting. As previously noted, city staff utilized Costa Mesa as the base for this proposed ordinance. The intent of this ordinance is not to prohibit or discriminate against individuals living in group setting, only to regulate the use and to ensure compatibility with neighborhood characteristics while furthering the purposes of federal and state laws protecting fair housing. Before you are some of the comment, a summary of some of the higher level um, topics of the comments received, including what the distance between group homes, um, invasion of privacy, um, and then ongoing litigation. The next steps include if introduced tonight that the second reading is tentatively scheduled for December 16th, along with the proposed fee resolution. The fee will be based on the reasonable cost of administering the permit. Followed by adoption, it will be presented to the California Coastal Commission in December or January. Staff recommendation is to introduce the ordinance as recommended by Planning Commission. This concludes the presentation by staff. Staff in the City Attorney's Office is available to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. My question is how many do we have in Encinitas? So um, the exact number is unknown because we actually don't have a process to actually track them. So the ones that we know about are typically we'll hear about through complaints received in code enforcement or calls asking for information if one exists in, a, in that location. How many do we think we have? Um, I, I think we have, um, see, I have, I know about, I think five. Oh, so we, we know about five and you, do you think we have maybe five others that are, that are unpermitted or do you think it's like a magnitude of 10? I honestly, I, I can't say cause we don't have that problem. We don't have a tracking me mechanism. I just know of five, um, recent code enforcement complaints. But those five and any others will need to come in to get this permit now. Correct. Right. So we, we will know <laughs> soon. Um, okay. Well, good. This is, I mean, just to reiterate, this is allowed under state law. And uh, this is a way for us to, um, to make sure that there aren't any neighborhood concerns that are um, spilling over and there shouldn't be already, but this allows us to, to regulate that. Right. Correct. Okay. Um, I think we have what, six speakers. So maybe we should go ahead. Yes. And speakers. Okay. Uh, first speaker is Simone Rupp. Simone, you can start um, when you're ready. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Blake Spear and council members. So I'm Simone Ruff, Director with Corporation for Supportive Housing. We're a national nonprofit focused on housing solutions for people with disabling health conditions. And we at CSH have strong concerns regarding the proposed ordinance. 
Um, under your proposed ordinance, a group home would have to meet infeasible requirements in, in order to operate. And I wanna highlight that your ordinance defines a group home as providing a supportive shared living environment for persons who are considered handicapped. And that by definition, these homes do not provide care and supervision or any, any kind of licensed care. And I completely agree <laughs> that it's important for the city to address nuisance properties, but this ordinance uh, will fail to accomplish its intended purpose and it will undermine efforts to create housing options for people with disabilities. And it will create significant roadblock to your draft homeless action plan. Uh, as you know, a key strategy in the draft plan is to maximize existing housing resources by implementing a shared housing strategy and folks coming from homelessness are often disabled. Um, in your housing element, you highlight the need to increase housing options for special needs populations, including persons with disabilities. Um, you also have reference to bridge to housing committee activities and allocating funds to shared housing strategies. And this ordinance would immediately prevent you from achieving those goals. Um, and zoning ordinances intended to limit who can live in the neighborhood, particularly if they are by definition part of, part of a protected disabled class, does violate fair housing laws and subjects the city to legal liability and a potential loss of federal funds such as CDBG funding. And when looking at prior court decisions and the current ruling in Costa Mesa is a temporary ruling, um, there is risk for the city in pursuing the ordinances written. And it's clearly established that municipal ordinances can't specifically target types of housing that serve people with disability. And the proposed ordinance severely limits housing options for people with disabilities who by definition are more likely to need share to share housing in order to afford housing. And lastly, I just wanna say the, the provisions in the ordinance don't really address neighborhood complaints about nuisance homes. The community issues related to nuisances can and should be addressed by enforcing existing laws aimed at nuisance abatement. So I highly recommend pulling back this ordinance and considering non-discriminatory approaches, which are out there that address the important concerns that this ordinance is trying to address. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lana Lowe. Lana, you can start when ready. Thank you, Mayor and City Council, for the opportunity to comment. I'm Lana Lowe, and I'm a program manager for the Recovery Residents Association that is facilitated by Community Health Improvement Partners. I want to raise concerns regarding Ordinance Number 2020-16, regulating group homes, including sober living homes, operating in the city of Encinitas. The Recovery Residents Association is a professional association that supports the San Diego Drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system with high quality shared housing for individuals with substance use disorder or co-occurring disorder. We support over 39 recovery residences with a total of 307 beds. I have been on every home visit and I am confident that each individual living in these homes is living in a safe and structured environment. We educate our homes on how to operate high quality recovery residences. Limiting group homes will impact affordability for individuals with disabilities and not support homelessness initiatives, such as Housing First model. This model is to provide individuals experiencing homelessness with housing and supportive services. If the city of Encinitas approves this ordinance, it will limit housing for those facing homelessness and we will lose numerous affordable group homes. Group homes may allow integrate into their communities more efficiently and individuals may find it socially supportive by choosing where they want to live. It is not feasible to build additional affordable housing units in Encinitas, closing the door on those who can attain and maintain affordable housing through group homes will limit options to people experiencing homelessness. We don't want to see barriers for individuals and families trying to stay housed, seeking to leave homelessness or living in shared housing just to get by in their communities. Everyone deserves a decent place to live. The Recovery Residents Association values the voices of those with lived experiences. We are accountable for high quality housing and we collaborate with community partners to build trust and capacity in the community. So we would like to see the city of Encinitas stand by these values and also consider alternative approaches. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ilana Soltz. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor Blakespear and council members. 
I am here to express my significant concerns with draft ordinance 2020-19, eliminate housing options for people with disabilities. My name is Ilana Soltz and I am the operations manager for the San Diego Independent Living Association. This association is also operated by Community Health Improvement Partners, a small local nonprofit. I work every day with the people that operate quality independent living homes, which are also shared living environments here in San Diego County. And if this ordinance is passed, you'll be making it infeasible for their homes to stay open. You will be dismantling an affordable housing option for people with disabilities in the community, and this will become part of our community's housing problem. Our program is funded by the County of San Diego to educate and train the operators of shared living environments and to be of assistance and support to those operators, the tenants and the community at large, rather than assuming that all are low quality or that they are a blight to the community. My colleagues and I are in independent living homes throughout the county each week, and we see what these homes truly are. They are people on limited incomes living together as a family in a communal setting. When we are doing our home visits, we see tenants eating meals together, planning to run errands together, socializing and supporting each other. I was in a member home just last week where they had a picture frame up in the living room with a picture of each member of the household. For those that are unaware, it is a time to make yourself aware that a family is not only those to whom we are related, a family is what we create in our homes. Currently, we have 100 member homes in our association throughout the county. These homes are not regulated. They are not required to join our association. They do so because they care about their tenants and they are concerned about the lack of affordable and appropriate housing for people with disabilities. If you continue down the path of creating challenges and barriers to those operating quality shared living environments, you will be discriminating against seniors, veterans, people living with mental health illness, people living with substance use disorder and other disabling conditions. You will be impeding these groups from their ability to recover from their illnesses and thrive in the community. This is not only discriminatory, but one should consider the lack of consideration for people's right to affordable and appropriate housing if you approve this ordinance. Our organization and association do not recommend you move forward with consideration or approval of this ordinance on the basis of its discrimination against and exceptional lack of regard for people with disabilities. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Garrett Pribolo. I'm sorry if I mispronounced. Hi, no, no, um, all the time. It's Pribolo. Nice to meet you all. Um, good evening, Mayor Blake, student and council members. Uh, I'm an attorney from the law firm Dallas, and I was also one of the trial attorneys on these reference Costa Mesa litigations. And I agree with everything the prior um, three speakers have had to say so far, which is generally not um, how these hearings go. And Mayor Blakesfield, you, you asked the two most important questions here at the outset. Um, you asked for some data, for some evidentiary support and um, and we didn't hear any. And given the implications for passing this ordinance, um, which the city, I think we said, I heard that there's maybe five known homes. Um, and based on what the first speaker said that these are temporary rulings, I think it would make a lot of sense. I mean, really to wait and let the Costa Mesa litigation play out. The cases cited by the city in support of taking these measures are all temporary rulings. Even the Ninth Circuit case 56077, that's Ninth Circuit case 19-56077. I was a handling attorney on that case, SoCal versus City of Costa Mesa. And while it was a Ninth Circuit decision upholding the denial of a preliminary injunction, it was a very narrow issue. It, this issue was so narrow that it came down to whether or not the court abused its discretion in denying an injunction over a reasonable accommodation request of approximately 12 feet. That's to say that my client had a home that was 638 feet from the, you know, the, the proposed, uh, the alleged conflict home. And this was a very, very narrow issue. And, and, and the Ninth Circuit upheld Judge Selma's ruling, but um, it didn't determine the legality of the underlying ordinances, ordinances 14-13 and 15-11. 
like in um, most municipalities, the first two numbers there are the year the ordinance was passed. So ordinance 14-13 was passed in the year 2014. It's taken about six years, but we've got it up to the Ninth Circuit. I was also one of the trial attorneys on the Yellowstone matter. And there, there were several issues with that case that we think are going to be reversed on appeal. Um, and so the city of Encinitas was smart in, in adopting resolutions to delay and push this back and wait and see. And now after six years, we're going to have, whether it be in our favor or in Costa Mesa's, there's going to be a precedent set. There's going to be a legal precedent set by the Yellowstone matters and the cases that are following. And, um, and then there will be some legal, solid legal footing for cities to rely upon, but this is a little premature. These are temporary rulings. We've filed our appellant's brief. This is almost fully briefed. The city of Costa Mesa got a brief extension. And so we're expecting to have this precedent come down in early 2021. Um, it looks like I don't have a whole lot more time here, so I'll conclude with that. But um, thank you all for your time and consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sherry Daly. Sherry, you can start when ready. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, Mayor Blake Sarah and council members. I'm Sherry Daly with the California Consortium of Addiction Programs and Professionals. We represent over 20,000 addiction counselors, over 100 treatment programs, and over 350 quality sober living uh, programs throughout the state. Uh, we are also a, the state affiliate for the National Alliance for Recovery Residents, which means we certify homes throughout the state. And we are a state chapter for Faces and Voices of Recovery, which is a consumer group looking to make sure that people who uh, are in recovery have their rights protected. Um, we don't own any facilities. We don't own any programs. We don't own, own any sober livings. I just want to update you on, on the state of whether this entity can be regulated or not. We have both our administration and uh, our legislature have determined that these are homes. They're not facilities. So calling group homes places where people want to live together. Facilities is a misnomer. Department of Healthcare Services has declared continuously that it will not regulate these homes because they are strictly housing. Um, on the other hand, the, the legislature held a day long hearing on this issue. And the result was that they determined that any attempt to regulate these homes is discriminatory and in violation of both state and federal fair housing and disability rights laws. So I'm not sure uh, where the evidence is that this is actually a legal um, position that the city can take in regulating them. As far as the practical impact of the ordinance, it will close down any of these group homes that uh, serve people in recovery. Limiting a uh, home to six persons makes the rent that's divided between them too high to pay. 24 hour staff requires paying someone three eight hour shifts. That's $11,160 added to the rent each month. Um, the year of sobriety is also a problem because many people move out of sober living at that point. So you're limiting the, the, the ability to have strong leaders in our homes. And the um, really um, awful uh, background checks would just eliminate a lot of people who want to do good and want to give back and want to be uh, house managers. So basically it comes down to, I, I gave a really detailed analysis of the ordinance and what the theme of that is, is if you can do this without discriminating. So the question is, could you do this with another group? Would you be allowed to say that people who are LGBTQ could only live in groups of six and they would have to come and tell you about their living situation. You would have to let go into their home and inspect it. You would you would be allowed to look at their activities and see where they've gone and what types of things that they've, they've done during the week. Would you be able to do this to a group of blind people? How about a group of disabled veterans? Of course you wouldn't. And that's the point. There is no difference. This is a group of people who are protected and all they're doing is living together. And it's really important that the city take this at a, at a higher level and look at the obvious impact it would have on homelessness, the impact it would have on people's ability to maintain long term sobriety and reduce crime and drug use. And let's uh, get together and let's make the city of Encinitas a recovery friendly community, not one that uh, is not recovery friendly. Thank you. Our final speaker is Robert Wilson. Robert, you can start when you're ready. Good, e good evening, Mayor Blake Spear and City Council members. I've been providing safe supportive housing for those in recovery from addiction in Encinitas for more than seven years without incident. 
Although the current coronavirus pandemic has taken center stage during the last eight months, our country and even in this community, we are also fighting a surging epidemic of drug and alcohol related ailments and deaths. This epidemic is being compounded by the unprecedented times and measures that we are all taking to attempt to curb coronavirus spread. Rates of depression, mental health ailments, and suicide are staggering. Self-help meetings such as AA, NA, and NAMI, which are the most common and successful routes that many recovering individuals engage in, are crippled by the pandemic. Supportive living and sober homes are one of the very few places a person struggling with addiction can turn for help with this unforgiving disease. Now is not the time to limit access to these resources. Additionally, it is highly likely that in federal appeals court in 2021, that the Costa Mesa ordinance from which Encinitas ordinance was crafted will be overturned. As an operator, the following aspects are the most problematic and need more consideration before the city proceeds. I ask you to consider the following in the context of the low incident of actual problems sober livings have in Encinitas. I would argue that Encinitas does not have a problem with sober livings. Five homes for a 62,000 plus person community is not enough. We cannot reduce the number of available beds. First, limiting the number of residents to six will create the most obvious and immediate harm in our community. The result will be drastically fewer housing opportunities for those seeking recovery and the cost of sober living will skyrocket. This is an untenable proposition during a pandemic that is directly impacting countless people. Not only will the number of beds be reduced immediately, but with 100% certainty, all homes will eventually close in Encinitas should this city enforce this ordinance. This may sound extreme, or, or like a scare tactic, but it is sadly true. If presented with the totality of the considerations, I believe each member of the council would come to the same conclusion. I do not believe that it is, this, it is the city's intention to completely drive sober livings out. Second, the ordinance mandates that a sober living home must have 24 hour on-site management. I support a vast amount of oversight at sober living homes. However, this stipulation leaves no clear path forward for an operator. Please consider, is this saying that the 24 hour manager must be on site at all times? Is it saying that the manager must be available 24 hours a day, but not necessarily on site at all times? There's no clarity. Placing any requirement on a house manager for how their time should be spent will require them in the eyes of the law to be considered an employee. 24 hour employment will cost a sober living home a minimum of $11,000 per month. Add this cost to at this cost of owning or renting a home and all associated costs, each resident will need to pay in excess of $3,500 per month, probably more, just to cover the cost. With only six residents max, all Encinitas sober living homes close under this proposition. We need clarity of what 24-hour on-site management me means before this passes. Um, in conclusion, the result of the passing of this ordinance will lead to one of the outcomes. Sober livings are driven to operate illegally. They decide to engage the city in expensive litigation or they leave the community entirely. None of these options are in the best interest of any party affected. The city must wait for the resolution of ongoing Costa Mesa litigation before passing this ordinance. Thank you. That does conclude speakers on this item. Okay, thank you. Council member Kranz. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> sober living facilities are big business. And I think it's uh, clear by the people who have spoken tonight that there's um, a lot at stake for these big businesses. I appreciate all the work that everyone who spoke does to help people try and get over the significant impacts of drug and alcohol abuse. And I have no interest in shutting these facilities down. But I do think it's really important that we provide the residents of this city with some ways that they can maintain their communities that don't turn cul-de-sacs around the city into sober living cul-de-sacs. And so, uh, because in 2015, 2014, 2013, we heard a lot from neighborhoods who were having the significant impacts of sober living facilities in their communities, in their neighborhoods, we initiated action. And I think we did the wise thing by postponing the second reading of that ordinance and, and allowed it to work its way through the judicial system. And I think I agree with the city attorney that we're at a point now where it's acceptable to adopt an ordinance. I appreciate the effort that went into updating what we had done back in 2015, 
to get it more in line with the current Costa Mesa ordinance. And I think that this gloom and doom that we've been hearing from these speakers, I don't think that's gonna be the case. It will require that they spend some effort in getting uh, legal per this new ordinance. But I think that's the very minimum that we should we we are at, you know need to ask in order to protect the the folks who live in the neighborhood that these sober living facilities also inhabit. And so uh, I would move that we adopt this ordinance and and uh, adopt staff recommendation. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I will second the motion, and I'll just say, you know, I'm compassionate to what the speakers were saying the the idea that um basically we're putting hurdles in front of them that are going to drive up costs and um that businesses could be affected by that, the, the the girls that are run in neighborhoods um you know i think it is a goal of the city to help people who need it and to provide um options for people and recognize that they're along a full spectrum and people need help and housing at all levels. I think on the other side, we're trying to preserve the community's um, sense of the neighborhoods as they exist and they exist with families in various configurations, but um, we have had complaints. We've had neighborhood complaints and we've been unable to manage those with the tools that we've had. So, you know, I know that one of the things I, had been surprised that when I first got involved in local government was how many things you do need a permit for, you know, that you need a permit to have a little farm stand outside your house, or you need a permit if you want to sell merchandise on the street corner. Um, and so getting a permit to run a group home and uh, to me seems reasonable. Um, so, you know, I don't want to foreclose options for people, but I also want to make sure that we have the tools in place to, to, um, keep our neighborhood integrity uh, in terms of um, the, the standards that people expect, the basically the nuisance things, to be able to control the nuisance things. Um, so I know we've talked about this uh, over many years, so we have been waiting a long time and I, I rely on our attorney um, and professional staff to decide about whether the temporary ruling is so temporary that we shouldn't be acting or if we're positioned, if it is overturned to rescind our ordinance and get ourselves immediately into compliance. I think that's a really important part. Um, but I, I would like to ask the city attorney or the staff to, to just address that part. This is Leslie. Thank you, mayor and members of the council. Um, yeah, you're, uh, this, all the issues that have been talked about, we've been monitoring and watching um, the regulated community give their, their thoughts. These issues have been covered in the courts. And, you know, in, in, in situations like this, I, we get the, the argument that nothing is final. Well, sometimes litigation doesn't always necessarily become final. And there's a lot of, and there's a lot of litigation that just keeps going on. But the bottom line is that all the issues that have been brought up have been litigated and there have been green lights. Um, so you're in a position to uh, absolutely move forward tonight. Uh, and also to your question, Mayor, should um, Costa Mesa's regulations be invalidated under the Yellowstone case, which we kind of expect a decision in early 2021, um, the city can amend, adjust, repeal, or just not enforce the ordinance. So there's really no downside in moving forward legally. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so I don't see any other hands ready, so let's go ahead and vote. All right, and I'm just going to clarify that the motion is to introduce Ordinance 2020-16. Um, Council Member Hubbard? Yes. Council Member Mosca? Yes. Council Member Cram? Yes. Deputy Mary Hinsey? Yes. And Mayor Blakespear? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. So I think um, we're going to push the pavement management item. Uh, we don't have any speakers on it, but um, I wanna make sure we have time to go into that. And 
So we're going to push that forward to our uh, future meeting. I think we don't have a very heavy agenda next week. So um, we will move on to the other things, council member reports and city manager reports. Does anybody um, on council want to report from any of your boards? I would re like to report that tomorrow we will have a, uh, a North County Transit District meeting and there will be a special workshop starting at one o'clock that will <clears throat> get into the issues of liability insurance market and the, the, uh, the diminishing uh, underwriters that are uh, affecting the uh, ability to purchase liability insurance. And then we will also be discussing um, the railroad safety measures that are being uh, advanced um, with regard to fencing in the rail corridor in Del Mar, Encinitas and Oceanside. So uh, the meeting will then be followed by the regular meeting and uh, I don't expect it to be as exciting as that uh, workshop that starts at one o'clock. <laughs> Sounds very exciting. Okay, good to know, thank you. Um, okay, anybody else um, need to report? Okay, city manager report? Uh, nothing to report tonight, Madam Mayor. Okay, city attorney report? Nothing to report tonight, thank you. City clerk report? Yeah, just really quick. Um, the Registrar of Voters updated um, the unofficial election results today. Um, they still have outstanding ballots to be processed and about 8,000 of those. So just, we've gotten a lot of calls and just so everybody understands, the Registrar of Voters still has to count all those votes and then they will take time to run all their um, checks and double checks they have until December 3rd to certify the election. And once they certify the election, then city council will be accepting that certification at a special meeting on December 8th. Okay, thank you. So 8,000 votes remaining is for the whole county, not for Encinitas. That's for the whole county, correct. And there's no way to determine if any of those apply to Encinitas or not. Okay. Can you explain, um, you know they they were they were knocking out about ten thousand ballots a day uh, for a while, and then all of a sudden it's hit two thousand a day. Is that because they have fewer workers, or are there complications with the ballots that remain? Um, I don't know the answer to that specifically, but typically, as you get closer, there's a number of provisional ballots um, that take longer to process. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Um, just to clarify, so on the 8th, that's a Tuesday special meeting where we'll uh, swear in the council members um, and then remotely, right? And then Correct. A relatively short meeting. And then on the 9th, we'll have our regular council meeting. Correct. Okay, and we also have um, next weekend, next week is Thanksgiving, so we don't have our meeting. Um, and so I wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. I hope you are able to celebrate remotely and not get uh, catch coronavirus from um, getting together in groups inside that you're not supposed to be doing in the purple tier. Uh, so happy Thanksgiving to everybody. And with that, we are adjourned. Thanksgiving. Hi, everybody. Bye. Happy Turkey Day. Exactly.